Um, welcome to the planning committee meeting. My name is Councillor Sue Craig. I'm chair of the committee meeting. Please can I remind everyone to switch their iPhones, iPads, anything that makes a noise onto silent. Um, can I also um, let everyone know that the meeting is being filmed and the recording will be available on the council's website. Anyone speaking that does not wish to be filmed should make themselves known to the camera operator, which is behind me. Um, emergency and evacuation procedure. If I could ask our Democratic Services Officer, Karina Haskins, to read out this procedure. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. If the continuous alarm sounds, you must evacuate the building and proceed to the named assembly point. From this room, you follow the green running person sign to the exit using either the main staircase or the stone staircase at this end of the room. Please do not use the lifts. The assembly point for the building is at the Orange Grove grassed area opposite Bath Abbey. Thank you. Thank you, Karina. And do we have any apologies for absence or substitutions? No apologies. Thank you. Um, and declarations of interest, do we have any from the floor, please? Councillor Hughes. So I just want to mention that um, on the first item to do with um, the flower and Hayes development, I own a, an industrial unit on the existing development. It doesn't actually make any, I don't think it has any bearing on what we're discussing today, but I thought I'd mention it. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, there's no urgent business agreed by the chair. Um, so item five, uh, I'll just ask Karina to read out the public speaking procedure. Thank you, chair. Members of the public and parish councillors, uh, sorry, starting the wrong bit. Speakers will be called to speak immediately after the case officer has made their presentation about the application. The order of speakers and the time allowed for speaking will be as follows. Firstly, par any parish and town council representatives will speak first. They'll be allowed three minutes in total. Then any objectors to an application will speak and will be allowed three minutes in total. Then supporters of an application will speak and be allowed three minutes in total. Finally, any ward councillors not on the committee who have indicated that they wish to speak may do so for a maximum of five minutes. Speeches will be timed by the traffic light system you can see on the table next to me. At the start, the light will be green and will turn to amber when there is one minute of speaking time remaining. When the light turns red, speakers should immediately conclude their remarks. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the minutes from the 8th of March have been circulated. Do I have any amendments or otherwise can have a proposal and a second? Uh, uh, Councillor Jackson. Thank you. Councillor Simmons, do you want to second that? Oh, thank you. I'll sign those in a moment. Um, we have nothing on the site visit list from the last meeting, so we go straight on to the main plans list and the first item, which is Langley's Lane, if I could ask the officer to do her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So this application is an outline planning application with all matters reserved except for access for small-scale industrial units and associated works uh, adjacent to the existing Old Mills Industrial Estate uh, on Langley's Lane in Poulton. So here is the site location plan. You can see the site edged in red and then the existing Old Mills Estate has a blue uh, line around it. Uh, the aerial view provides quite a helpful image of, of the field. Um, Langley's Lane is located here. I'm going to start with some site photographs. I think it's quite useful to be able to kind of uh, see the site in, in context. So this, these photographs are taken standing um, in the existing Old Mills Industrial Estate looking towards where the site access will be. So the site access will uh, be a continuation of, of this existing road. You can see it a bit clearer here. So the site will go into this field as existing and some views across across the field from from this access so you can see there's nothing on the land uh, at the moment and then just a couple more photos just to give you an idea of the lay of the land and then I've taken some uh, screenshots from some other viewpoints from Google actually so this photo here is taken while standing on Langley's Lane um, looking into into the sites obviously 
it's not the best view because there is some hedging and, and vegetation in the way. And then this, this view here I've, I've taken from Google, which is across the, uh, almost across the valley, I suppose. So the site is, is over here. You can actually see the existing uh, Old Mills Industrial Estate uh, just here. And then this is, this is the site here. So I've got an indicative site layout plan. So the application is uh, an outline application with access the only matter to be determined at this stage. So this is indicative, um, but hopefully it gives, gives the committee an idea of, of what may come forward at reserve matter stage in terms of the layout of the industrial units. Um, you can see that there are there is a high uh, number of there are high numbers of trees proposed to be planted. I've got a plan later on to show that in a bit more detail. Um, and then the access to be determined is just here. I've shown it with the red arrow, and it's coming from the uh, existing Old Mills Industrial Estate. So again, appearance and scale are reserved matters, but the applicants provided some indicative uh, drawings to show how the units may look and may come forward at reserved matters stage. Um, I just, again, thought this would be helpful to include uh, just, to, just to kind of give members an idea of what, what may come forward on the site in the future. So then this is the ecological constraints and biodiversity net gain plan, which has been submitted with the application. Um, again, the layout is indicative, um, so this isn't, this isn't set in stone, but in, in purple, we've got a 10 meter wide landscape buffer proposed. And then here in, in the pink color uh, is a 15 meter wide landscape buffer. And then this yellow bit at the bottom is native scrub planting. There's almost a hectare of uh, native, native scrub planting along this this uh, boundary here and then the dark kind of circles are proposed trees um, and there's some existing trees you can see of a little bit paler I hope you can see those okay um, and I've also included the pros highways work so members will have seen that we are seeking um, contributions and the provision of, of highways works uh, as part of the application so uh, there are some proposed uh, pedestrian crossings with tactile paving. The pavement, the existing footway, which is about a metre and a half wide, is being widened to a three metre wide footway, uh, shared footway cycleway. Um, there will be some upgrades to the existing bus stops here and here. They will have shelters, raised curbs and, and carriageway markings and a, a central refuge here and here. Um, and that, the, those works are proposed to be secured through a section 106 and will be delivered by the uh, applicant. And then in the report, uh, we've discussed the highways works, the Thicket Mead roundabout. So the applicant put forward uh, some improvement works to Thicket Mead to uh, offset the impact of their development. Um, as you'll all be aware, the council are proposing an LDO on, uh, for the Soma Valley Enterprise Zone on the site, uh, on the southern part, southern portion of, of this road, opposite this site. And as part of that, uh, the council are proposing their own works, the Thicket Mead Roundabout. Uh, as kind of explained in the report, it, it, it didn't seem sensible for the applicant to deliver their own roundabout works for the council to then essentially come and dig them up and put their own works in. So we're seeking a contribution which is equivalent to uh, the, the cost of the works the applicant would have needed to do to make their uh, development uh, acceptable in highways terms. So this plan here is actually taken from the um, LDO public file and these are the works that the council are proposing to Thicket Mead Roundabout to um, offset the, the highways impacts of, of the LDO and, and this development. So the application is recommended for permission, subject to the conditions in the committee report, update reports, and the heads of terms being secured through a section 106 agreement. Thank you very much. Just before we move on to speakers, could you, for the benefit of everybody who might not know, um, say what LVO means? Yeah, so the LDO is the local development order for the Sober Valley Enterprise Zone. Thank you. Um, right, we've got two speakers. Um, do we have Chris Dance, please? If you'd like to come up to the front. This room's quite echoey, so if you could speak as near to the mic as you can, you can bend it to bring it near to you. And you can start Thank you, Chair. Start Thank you, members. Ready. I'm representing the agents for the application. 
The application comes before you have to extensive dialogue with a case officer and other consultees, which has taken place during the formal assessment of the application. This was resulted in the thorough report before you today, and I just want to highlight the key issues from that. The application seeks outline planning permission for small-scale industrial development with all matters reserved apart from access. What's critical is the site is allocated for employment purposes in the place baking plan. This is an allocated site and it's bringing forward that principle of development for employment purposes which will create a significant amount of new employment opportunities which is a key benefit of this scheme. Now, leading on to detail matters, highways is a critical issue, which we, we acknowledge, and the officer's report makes clear there's going to be extensive uh, improvement measures as a part of the scheme, which include a financial contribution to upgrading the Thicket Mead roundabout, a package of off-site accessibility improvements and upgrades to the existing bus stop facilities, and the delivery of an extension to the sustainable transport link ST2 Norton Radstock Greenway through the site. And the, as you'll see, the highway officers raise no objections to the application. Similarly, extensive consultations have taken place to the council's biodiversity officers who raise no objection to the scheme. What is critical with a modern decision-making on planning purposes, biodiversity net gain is an issue of high weight, and this scheme addresses it thoroughly. The issue of landscape and appearance has also been comprehensively addressed in the committee report. This latter was before the inspector on the previous appeal who was satisfied there would be no adverse impacts. Accordingly, the revised application is not materially different from the previous era appeal. And I fully agree with the committee report that opportunities for further consideration of these matters can come forward at the reserved matters stage. Other matters, including flooding and drainage, or residential amenity and sustainable construction have all been addressed. Suitable conditions have been recommended in the officer report, and these can be thoroughly addressed at the reserve matter stage. So in conclusion, this report before you addresses all the key planning issues of the scheme, and it scores higher in each one. And finally, I'm going to go a little bit off piece from the script here, that I'll just repeat again. This is an allocated site for employment purposes. To achieve sustainable development in Baines, you need a balance. You need housing, you need employment opportunities as well. Quite regularly, I'll be honest, I'm here talking about housing schemes. This is completely different. As part of the wider ambit of Bain, this is an important part of delivering employment purposes. And for myself personally, I think that's a really important principle of achieving wider sustainable development within Bain. So I conclude by urging you to follow the officer's recommendation and grant planning permission for the development. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have one other statement. It's just from the ward member, Councillor Liz Hardman, who's been unable to attend today. So Karina is going to read that for us. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, I would like to apologise for not being able to attend this meeting due to a pressing commitment. I would like to object to the planning application, parcel 916 Langley Lane Porton. I understand the application relates to access only in this instance. However, I would like to remind you that this site is a greenfield site. It is of the highest quality agricultural land, so why build an industrial estate here? However, for some reason it has been classified for business use, so the principle of loss has been established. The objections I have are as follows. Despite highway improvements, a travel plan and roundabout remodelling, the measures will be insufficient to mitigate the extra traffic generated. Not fully explained in this report is that the Summer Valley Enterprise Zone is also planned for this area, about 100 metres on the other side of this road. It will comprise 13 hectares of land devoted to industrial and commercial use, usage, creating 1,300 jobs. Some updates have been provided by the planning officer, but the SVEZ is part of the local plan partial update which was passed in all its entirety by Baines Council, January 2023. Although there is some information on the remodelled roundabout at Thicket Mead, there is insufficient data to suggest this will stop traffic queuing on this roundabout at peak times. There is also no information on the predicted traffic growth, which would have an effect on the Thicket Mead roundabout. As you know, 72 more houses are planned for Porton. Cycling to work once a week, as per travel plan, is not deliverable due to poor cycle routes 
There is not enough information on the proposed pedestrian cycle improvements. Connecting with the existing infrastructure, such as the Norton Radstock Greenway, it is not clear how cyclists would share a path on the A362 carriageway. Some units in Phase 1 of the Industrial Estate 1 are empty, which demonstrates Phase 2 is not needed. For all, all of these reasons, we hope the Planning Committee will not support this application. That's Councillor Liz Hardman. Thank you. Um, right, questions to the officer. Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Okay, so I think my I've got a lot of questions, but I think initially I just want to look at this um, the issue of the Soma Valley Enterprise Zone and the relationship of this site to that. Um, so obviously, we've, we've already pass, passed now the LDO for the Soma Valley Enterprise Zone, which is on the opposite side of the road. Um, so I guess the first question is, how have we ensured that the two sites are complementary to each other? Um, because the LDO is very, um, is very detailed in its constraints on design and structure and layouts of the, the Soma Valley Enterprise Zone side. How do we make sure, how do we make sure that this site is complementary to that? Um, secondly, on the, t uh, in terms of the highways and, and transport, have we, are we actually confident that we've done the modelling that combines the, the both sites, the, 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 the highways requirements for both sites simultaneously? Or are we just looking at two separate res reports for two different sites and not actually bringing them together? Um, and I guess my third concern is in amongst this, between the Soma Valley Enterprise Zone and this new development, is a, a row of houses called Springfield Gardens that are going to effectively find themselves sandwiched between two new industrial zones. What mitigations are, are we putting in place to, for those properties? Thank you, Councillor Hughes. So in, in relation to your first question, in terms of being complementary and, and in terms of the design, um, obviously the LDO is, is not a planning application, so there are obviously parameters to which application, applications essentially which come forward in that area will have to work to, and that's why those parameters have been set for that. In this case, obviously this is an outline application, so we haven't got any information yet in terms of the scale, the appearance, um, or the design of, of the units. Obviously we have been presented with um, some indicative drawings, an indicative layout, which can give us an idea of what might come forward, but that would essentially really be a matter of a reserve matter stage um, when we would be considering the design. And at that point, I think it would be appropriate to obviously look at what, what's been um, kind of scoped out for, for the LDO site to, to try and ensure that we have that continuity. Um, so that's not something which has really being considered as part of this application because we just haven't got that detail yet and that would need to come forward at the reserve matter stage. Um, I'll let Dan handle the highways, but I'll just answer your question in terms of uh, Springfield buildings. Um, if I just go back, sorry, very slowly. Here we go. So you can see them on the, they're shown on the plan and they're up here. Um, so yes, these dwellings, obviously we do need to consider the residential amenity of, of these dwellings. I mean, it's considered there is, there is a degree of separation between the, the residential units and, and the site. Um, and actually at reserve matter stage, the proposed landscaping is, is, is quite important to mitigate you know, not just the visual impacts, but I also think the potential residential amenity impacts um, that, that could occur on these properties. So again, landscaping is a reserve matter. Um, we obviously have the plan to show that there, there's going to be this 10 metre wide buffer um, and tree planting along, along that boundary, but we haven't yet set what, you know, what that is going to look like in practice. We have conditioned that that comes forward with the reserve matters application so that we can fully assess it. Um, the other thing which... I haven't added a condition at this stage. It is something the committee could uh, discuss should they, should they wish, but conditions in terms of um, hours of use, et cetera, just because we haven't got a, 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 a layout which is set in stone at this stage. Um, I think once we've got that, we can obviously kind of assess more fully um, 
what conditions may be appropriate in terms of the distances from the dwellings and uh, to, to put on at that, that time. But it is something the committee could, could look at if they wanted to. Um, and it may be at reserve matter stage we do request kind of further noise assessments, etc. when we've got that layout. Um, so hopefully that answers that and I'll let Dan handle the, Sorry, the highest. Would, yes. would you be able to, to, to show the relation uh, where the... In, the um, Soma Valley Industrial Zone is in relation to this. So I, I, I appreciate that I live there, but I think the majority of the, the, res, uh, the, the panel don't. So they probably don't understand yeah. the proximity of the two. I haven't actually got a map, unfortunately, showing that. But this this is the uh, A362, and it's it's kind of over here in this in this direction. Um, I apologise, I don't have a map of the the whole site. It's actually the. Where you see Springfield Gardens there, Here. that row of properties there, it's the entire field in front of that, or five fields in front of that, yeah. make up the Soma Valley Enterprise Zone. Mm. It's also worth noting the Councillor's point that um, there will be significant highway works in that area as well, so there will be a new roundabout providing access into that Enterprise Zone. So the highway layout you see on the screen there would be changed significantly in that scenario. Uh, in terms of um, highway impacts, let's move on to that as well. Izzy, could you put the roundabout up? Yeah. The roundabout designed for Thicket Mead that's shown on that drawing has been assessed for the um, Summer Valley Enterprise Zone and this development traffic. It's all been included within that modelling, um, and that provides capacity for, for both sites together. This developer for this site has also undertaken an assessment separately um, which considers the impact of their development alone, and there is a scheme provided for that scenario. If the Summer, Van, Summer Valley Enterprise, Enterprise Zone doesn't come forward, then that scheme could be provided in isolation as well. So it covers both. Sorry, can I just... So, uh, I mean, obviously, we're not increasing any capacity level in, at, the, at this roundabout. All we're doing is actually building in some, access, some, some um, cycling provision um, the, the capacity isn't going to increase. Uh, in terms of capacity, that would increase the capacity of the roundabout, yeah, because of the, the, the lane changes on the approaches and the design of the roundabout itself would increase it. That's what the modelling does demonstrate, yes. Okay, I'll be interested to understand how that works <laughs> at some point. Thank you. Okay, Councillor Jackson. Uh, no, your mic's not lighting up. Try it a few times. No, now it's on. Still can't hear you very well. I think you'll have to get a bit closer. Well, I can't. I've got a very bad back today. Okay, not to worry, not to worry. Chair. That's the problem. Thank you. Um, yes, I was try I'm trying to work out the relationship, the geography of this site. Calling it the Thicket Mead Roundabout has greatly confused me because I don't think it's anywhere near Phyllis Hill, is it? Or the Thicket Mead housing estate that's on the side of that. This is right round the corner as you're practically into Farrington Gurney and the golf course area. No? no? So, so where exactly is it? We haven't got a larger map, have we? No. That is Phyllis Hill going up. The that is Phyllis Hill. This one here, yeah, is Phyllis Hill. So this is that field by the uh, listed monument, the tump, yeah, I mean the batch. You were going to give some update on the traffic issue that I asked yesterday. Um, and we might also note that with the cuts to the bus service, we're likely to have bus shelters and only one bus an hour. Yeah, in terms of traffic, yeah, I think the question you asked yesterday was whether the traffic modelling has used appropriate data because some of the data was from 2021 and there was concern about whether the COVID pandemic would affect those, that data set. Um, there was data from 2019 as well and that's been compared and it shows it's actually quite comparable. Um, and in addition to that, the traffic modelling uh, assessed a 2026 scenario. So there was a huge amount of growth, well, the growth from... 21 to 2026 was applied um, so it was a higher level of traffic was assessed but it was comparable with pre-pandemic levels yeah. thank you Councillor Hansel uh, thank you chair um, but first question is a very short question um, uh, am I right 
in saying that the uses uh, uh, for this site will be class uh, in class E designation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. My uh, follow-on question to that is: uh, um, I had a look at um, the uses that are acceptable in Class E, and they cover things like uh, retail services, professional services, indoor sport, crash, uh, offices, and so on. Things that are, all sound pretty innocuous. But the very last one says: uh, any industrial process which can be carried out in any residential area without detriment to the amenity of that area by reason of noise, vibration, smell, fumes, smoke, soot, ash, dust, or grit. Now, what if a concrete making company came along and said, uh, right, we're, we're an industrial process and with um, suitable acoustic fencing and so on, um, and a you know, a, a, a sort of careful regime, uh, we can operate without detriment to the amenity. How could, how could we stop that? Um, is, is it um, clear from the definitions in, of Class E, or is it something that we need to be very careful about? Thank you, Councillor Hounsell. Um, yes, you're right. Class E is, is a very broad uh, use class, and that's why, obviously, we've, uh, well, I've, I've suggested a condition on the update report um, to restrict the uses to EG3, um, which is for the industrial processes that you're, you're referring to. Um, the original site allocation uh, in the placemaking plan referred to uh, use classes B1C, which is like industrial, uh, B8 and SUI for car showrooms. Obviously, this has been changed and updated through Class E, um, so it is slightly different. So I think the principle of an industrial process use ha is established through, through the uh, site allocation. I mean, in terms of the use that you're proposing, I think we would have to assess at the time whether that went beyond what could be considered the kind of light industrial which uh, or the industrial process that can be uh, undertaken within a res you know an area without detriment to residential amenity etc um, I mean a concrete works could potentially go beyond that depending on the scale of the use um, I think again it's something which a reserve matter stage once we have um, a layout set and and we know the scale of the units that are going to come forward and that you know that's that's a key issue as well I'm, I'm just going to flick back to um, the indicative unit plan. They're not, they're not massive units. They're, I mean, they're uh, 2,500 2, square feet or 1,000 square feet shown on these plans. Obviously, that is subject to change at reserve matters, but that will restrict somewhat what uses can come forward on the site. Um, I think, you know, we, we can condition management plans, etc., at reserve matter stage if, if we deem them appropriate. So I think these are all things which we can, um, we can look at and we can obviously try and minimise as far as possible for those residential properties that, that Councillor Hughes referenced, um, Springfield buildings. So I think, I think restricting the, the use class to that industrial process, e.g. three, is important and uh, would, would help to control that. Uh, right, uh, one more question. Um, Councillor Hardman, uh, the local councillor, in, in her uh, address that was read out, was uh, asserting that um, the highways measures uh, were uh, insufficient. Um, but am I right in saying that uh, because highways actually are raising no objection, uh, that uh, evidence would have to be uh, provided that, that uh, wasn't available to um, to, to highways uh, when they made their judgment so that if this went to appeal an inspector wouldn't, uh, uh, wouldn't rule a, a objection as being uh, it, you know, out of order, ir irrational. Um, so I'm just, make, just asking you to clarify, am I right in thinking that because no actual evidence, no data has been provided to support that assertion, it actually has, has got no weight in our discussion. Yes, yeah, so if, if the committee were minded to refuse the application on the basis of, of insufficient highways measures um, to mitigate the development, then we would be expected at appeal to be able to defend that and, and provide evidence to demonstrate why there would be harm in, in highways terms, which our highways, our highways officers haven't alleged any harm at, at this stage. Okay. Uh, and we have Councillor Bromley next. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Isabel. Um, 
It's just coming back to, well, firstly, um, I just wondered, uh, regarding the units in the phase one development, I just wondered um, what the adjoining units are used for and what, why a lot of them are empty, and how will this development enhance employment if the others are, or some of them are, un unoccupied? And the second question was um, just Councillor Jackson mentioned the, the buses. Um, so is there really only one bus an hour, um, you know, in, in serving this um, area? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bromley. Um, so in regard to the uses of the uh, adjacent estate, I actually don't have the planning permission to hand for that one, but when I visited it, it is light industrial. There are some offices there, workshops, etc. So it's a similar, it's a similar arrangement, um, I believe, and I'm sure Councillor Hughes might be able to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a continuation of the existing estate. Um, in terms of the empty units, obviously we, you know, as the council don't really have any control um, over that and I appreciate the comments that people have said that perhaps they don't feel that this development is necessary if there are other empty units in the area. That being said, the site is allocated for this purpose and therefore evidence has been kind of found at, at, at the time the, the placemaking plan was written by the council that it's, it's, it's suitable to allocate this site for this employment use. Um, in terms of enhancing employment, obviously it will provide a, a a larger amount of units and a greater range of units um, and hopefully will encourage uh, in, in businesses to, to come to the area um, but obviously you know the, the units won't be council run they will be privately owned and rented so you know we're obviously limited in terms of what the council can do in terms of encouraging people to, to take up the offering. Um, Moving on to the bus service, I don't have a bus timetable uh, before me. I obviously know there have been and are proposed cuts to, to bus services in this area. Um, again, it's not, you know, that's, that's relatively outside of, of council control. I don't know, Dan, if you've got anything you want to add in terms of the bus services. I'm just looking at the bus map, so give me a moment and I'll come back to you if that's okay. Thank you. Is that all right, Councillor Bromley? Thanks. Councillor Hodges. Councillor Hodge. Um, I just wanted is that, yeah it's working with the, with the roundabout delivery if um, so I've got a few questions but with the roundabout delivery if um, things are slow to come forward with the you might have said this already with the Soma Valley Enterprise Zone even with the development order how will the delivery of a roundabout be when will that happen in relation to this site um, how what, what was the time scale and how does that happen? Also, um, is this, you've just put a condition, you're possibly going to put the condition for light industrial. When we're doing, you're doing the traffic um, growth modelling and it said the applicant didn't have to speculate on what the um, enterprise zone would deliver. How, how did, um, but the LDO did have to um, take it on board what this site would deliver. How did they model it? What, what did they model it against? I mean, if it, how, how do you know what is it? The whole range of traffic. So if it's light industrial with lorries and concrete on this site, has that already been modelled for in the, in the range of things that could be on, on this site? Um, because, and we've only just considering putting a limitation on what's there. So um, is all that covered? And then the other question was um, about the cycleways. Um, this has been brought up. I wouldn't mind seeing how the cycleway connects to the Baines scheme that links with Radstock Greenway. And also um, the applicant has expressed a willingness to add an additional refuge to connect with the cycleway. Is that already on there as one of the refuges you mentioned? Or is that something we need to ask for or we could ask for as a condition um, yes uh, uh, sorry and I had to have a final question is the wording of EG3 is, is that wording just light industrial or is it is there anything more specific in in there than that do you want me to repeat those I think I've got them, but yeah, if, if, I, if I need you to clarify, I'll let yeah. you know. Thank you, Councillor Hodge. Um, so in terms of the roundabout delivery, um, I have spoken to the project team for the LDO to make sure that the provision of the Thicket Me roundabout is likely to come forward within the lifetime of, of this permission. Obviously, it would be very unreasonable of the Council to 
essentially said they're going to deliver something that they're not going to deliver before the permission expires. Um, that has been confirmed that that should be coming forward within a reasonable time frame in terms of obviously it's subject, there will be subject to change, but in terms of the lifetime permission, we're confident that it will be delivered. I think the other key thing is that obviously the council will have will have a, a proportion of money towards that which they will need to spend within a certain time frame. So I don't think it's, you know, we're not massively concerned that that money isn't going to get spent and the roundabout isn't going to get delivered. Um, there is also, as I've put in the update report, we think it necessary because works are required to the highway to make the development acceptable, that we control the occupation of the units um, to make sure that they're not occupied before before the roundabout is delivered. And that, again, is why I've had to kind of check that they will be delivered within a reasonable time frame. Um, so the council is satisfied that that, that will not be a problem. Um, in terms of, I will obviously let Dan answer that, the highways questions, but in terms of the use classes uh, in Class E, it is, it is industrial processes, but as uh, Councillor Hounsell um, clarified earlier, that is industrial processes that can kind of be undertaken in an area where you know it's not going to be of detriment to residential community so it's not it's not kind of heavy industrial uses um i class e is is kind of it is a broader use class category than what was originally put on site allocation when the placemaking plan was, was written, but we're in a situation where we have to work with the use classes that we've now got. Um, so I think that that really is, is the highest kind of restriction that we could reasonably put um, on, on the application in terms of the uses that would come forward on the site and would be consistent with what the allocation was, was seeking. Um, I'll flick back to the uh, highways plan here to just point out. So this... This is the uh, cycleway that is being proposed by the applicant here in green. And then this is a potential cycleway to come forward as part of the uh, northern parcel, so the LDO parcel. Um, I don't have a plan of the cycle works that are coming forward as part of the LDO, and I don't know if, if Dan might be able to, to clarify on that. But the, the refuges are here, so that would provide a crossing over to this, this cycleway on this side. And then there's another one down here as well. So they, they are shown on the plan, um, and I don't think anything additional needs to be secured in, in relation to that. I don't know, Dan, if you can answer. Um, I'll stay with this one at the moment. Uh, again, I think it's, it, this is probably going to be an interim scenario in terms of what happens before the LDO, because uh, as the point was made to the councillor earlier on, that when the LDO project comes along, there are significant changes going to happen to this section of road and it won't be lo a localised little junction into the LDO site. It'll be a significant uh, roundabout, and then there'll be cycleways and improvements to footways along the entire corridor. So it will link into that improvement. So this might be an interim scenario, which may never be delivered by itself. It will be become part of a bigger scheme. Um, you asked a question about traffic generation and how it's been modelled. In terms of the data that goes into those models, we use something called a TRIX database, which provides surveys from a whole range of similar sites from around the UK. Um, and therefore, we use a typical generation that would be expected at this type of development. We couldn't specifically go and pick individual land uses as, you know, say, a, a concrete batching plant. We couldn't do that, but we can just model what would be a typical development of that sort of size. Okay, okay, that answer you. all your yes, questions? Yes, thank you. Okay, Councillor Crossley. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the report. Um, can you just show me where the bus shelters are on the uh, two main roads going round it? Um, and are there any bus stops that don't have shelters? And can we ask as part of it that shelters are provided for all bus stops on, on this? We've got two, two sides to this, and then we've got the narrow Boxbury Hill on the other side. So these, this bus shelter here, or sorry, this bus stop as existing here and uh, here, they're, they're proposed to be upgraded as part of the proposed highways work, so they, will, they don't have um, shelters, etc. at the moment, so that's what the applicant is proposing, to provide them with a shelter, um, a raised curb and the carriageway marking. So that's, that's the upgrade to these two bus stops. So they will get um, shelters. And are they the only two bus stops on, on the two lanes that border this uh, uh, development, apart from Boxbury Hill, which is very narrow? I believe so, yes. These are the two main bus stops within the uh, vicinity of the site. 
when you say it's humane one, that indicates there might be some minor I don't, ones. As far as I'm aware, there aren't any other ones. Um, but as I say, these are the ones that we've, we've considered appropriate to upgrade. I'm not sure if there are any additional ones further down the road or up the road. Right. So, so what was your decision making in deciding that these are the only two appropriate ones? Because I personally think we should have an objective that every bus stop has a shelter to it, except I with think exceptions where it simply isn't possible. I think the, the decision making here is that when people are traveling to the site uh, by bus, these, these are the likely going to be the stops that they're most likely to use because they're in the closest proximity to the site. Um, we can't, you know, we can't open up that, that the applicant should provide bus shelters for an unlimited number of, of, of bus stops in the locality. Um, I think it, it's unreasonable to ask them to, to provide right. that. They are obviously offering this um, as they're going to be the stops that are most likely used. So that would be that would be my rationale behind this decision. Okay, that, that's fine. I accept that. And uh, the other point I'd like to ask is that uh, there will be some people that will walk to work as well as cycle or car. And, and what, what, can you just go over the provisions for pedestrian access to me again? Because I'd just like to get them firmly in my mind. Yeah, of course. So this, uh, this is an existing pavement at the moment. Uh, you can just see the bit that's kind of the darker green. That's the existing, which is a 1.5 meter wide kind of regular pavement. Um, so that will be widened so that it can be a shared footway and cycleway. Um, there's pedestrian crossings here and here with tactile paving. And again, these central refuges here and up here. Uh, will be will be provided for pedestrian access. So these are these are um, pedestrian upgrades within the immediate vicinity of the site, um, which again the highways team have decided are and, and have considered are reasonable and necessary to make the development acceptable. So just so I've got the sizings in my mind, if I think of a cycleway that's adjacent to a pavement that I use fairly regularly, Wickham High Street, where you've got a cycle lane and a, a pedestrian lane side by side. Is that new bit there going to be the same width as what's in Wickham High Street? Because I don't want to make it so that it's so narrow that we have conflict between cyclists and pedestrians. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the uh, exact situation in Wickham High Street. The width is the width is three meters, which is around double the width of a standard kind of pavement width. I don't know if you've kind of got another measure which might be helpful, Dan. Three metres would be the accepted width for a, a, um, a, cycle, yeah. a joint cycle footway at this sort of location, yeah, considering what the demand of cyclists would be, yeah, be accepted. Right, okay, that's uh, the other point I'll make is when I make my contribution, because I'm a, I, you know, I would like to put a restriction on delivery hours when we uh, come to the debate, but that's not a question, that's just a policy, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor McPhee. <clears throat> I'd like to ask the highways, um, what would be the average number of uh, traffic movements that you got in your modelling per day? I know the hour, I know by hour, um, but by date. So okay, by hour. By hour, in the peak hours, it's about, this site would generate about 110 movements an hour. 110 movements an hour? Yeah, about 80 in, well, it's... In the morning, it would be 80 in, about 30 out, and then in the mm. evening period, vice versa to that, yeah. Mm. Which is calculated on the, um, some work was done in terms of what the existing site does, and considering what the vacancy rates are, so it was generated from comparing what the existing site was, and then the other sites around, mm. in terms of the database, what they are. I just expressed some surprise that you don't need to do some pretty hard changes like adding lanes to the roundabout when you've got an extra 80 to 100 uh, an hour coming in. I, I realize that this is probably just a holding pattern until you do the major changes that you just talked about. In, in terms of the interim scenario, so if the Thicket Mead roundabout was going to be improved just to cater for this development itself, there would be changes to the approaches to the roundabout to provide widening, okay. as you suggest. Yeah. There would be widening, and so there would be another lane on some of the arms on the approach, so that would be done. Yeah. And yeah, that's the interim scenario if the LDO didn't come forward. The LDO scheme, as Izzy has shown on the screen, is something yeah. much more significant. Yeah. I mean, I just, well, I'll make the comment in the main. 
Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, so I've got two more on my list, Councillor Jackson and then Councillor Simmons. Uh, yes, I'm sorry I got a bit confused about the location because there are actually, of course, two Thicket Mead roundabouts, the other one being on the North Road nearer towards Radstock for the other exit from the Thicket Mead estate. Now, I'm, I'm wondering if you've really taken account of how much traffic has been generated by the Monger Lane development and by Thicket Mead, and I don't know that the um, residents the other side of the road from Thicket Mead have, have got a a name for what the estate is, but still, um, I, I'm very struck by the whole thing, especially by uh, Councillor McPhee's question, because you can even now get a jam right from the A37 down as far as um, the site, Langley's Lane. Um, and this is not get, you know, have you, have you considered what this is going to do to those traffic jams? Going back to the question of Buses. The, I'm thinking, of course, in terms of the service after June, when we won't have the 82, which currently goes past the estate but stops at 4 o'clock, and a very severe reduction in the 172, which goes up to Poulton Hospital, and we'll be left with this new bus, the 522, which just runs once a year very slowly around the villages. So, you know, I, I do ask, do you consider going forward after June, that this is a sustainable site? That's the first question. A second question, my confusion arose partly from the fact that I didn't see in the officer's report, but it may be in there somewhere, um, the impact that this development will have on the scheduled monument, the batch being only one of two in the entire country of this type and nature and therefore being listed so I'll, I'll answer the question about the uh, scheduled ancient monument and I'll let Dan cover the highways if that's okay. So I'm just going to go back to the site plan. So the, the, the site is actually a significant distance away from the uh, scheduled ancient monument. So it's not considered that it's in close enough proximity to affect, affect the scheduled ancient monument. Um, the archaeology, uh, our archaeology consultant was consulted and had no objection to the scheme. Um, and didn't request any conditions, uh, as far as I'm aware. Uh, again, if, if, if the committee considered it appropriate to, to add a condition for an archaeological watching brief, it is something that, that could be considered if, if it was considered fully justified. Um, so there isn't considered to be um, harm to the, to the scheduled ancient monument and, it, and its setting. Um, in regards to the highways, I don't know, Dan, if you've had, managed to have a look at the bus issue. Yeah, I think there was two questions. I think in terms of traffic impact and committed development. So um, development, local development was considered within the modelling and also, as mentioned earlier on, there was some allowance in terms of future year growth. So a 2026 scenario was applied, which in includes a percentage growth each year to um, reflect wider development proposals that may come in in the local area and therefore that growth is included in the modelling as part of that as well. Um, in terms of bus services, you're right, there are changes. Um, there will be buses within walking distance, whether they're, you consider those appropriate, um, that's a matter of judgment. Um, but it is one of the locations where buses will still be in walking distance and could be used. Okay, and finally, Councillor Simmons. Thank you. Um, are you aware of the fact that Wecker will take control of all the bus stops, now they're, they've, got, they've got the transport almost sorted out, and that means that those bus stops will have to be upgraded to the all singing, all dancing, you've just missed the bus timetable type thing. Yes, yeah, so any, any works that we agree will have to be aligned with the, the required specification. If that comes from Wecker, then that's what we have to do. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, sorry, Councillor Hughes, you had another question, did you? Sorry, I just one more question. So I just wanted to understand, the, um, this development has been refused before. I can't see any significant change from the previous applications that were refused to the current one which is recommended for permits. So is... The, is it, some, is it because there's been some sort of policy change or, is, or could you tell us what's changed in this development that's now made it permissible? 
Yes, of course. So um, one of the key matters was highways, so I'll let, I'll let Dan uh, talk about that one. But So the first application, I think, was refused um, 2019 or 2020, and then uh, a subsequent application was, was refused, I believe, in 2021, although I'd have to check the report. So while... Um, whilst the second application was in, the first application was going through appeal. Um, the appeal decision wasn't available uh, before the case officer made the recommendation on the, on the second application. Um, but the, the, the two main issues of contention at the appeal were, were really landscape matters and highways matters. Um, and the council had refused the application on the basis of, of the landscaping. They, we didn't consider it to be um, sufficient or, or major landscaping as required by the policy. However, um, the matter was debated and discussed at length at the, at the appeal hearing, um, and the inspector concluded that there was sufficient space on the site, even with the indicative layout, to provide uh, enough landscaping to mitigate the visual impacts and, and amenity impacts of the development. Um, nothing has significantly changed with this application since since that appeal. In fact, the amount of development shown on the indicative land, uh, layout plan, which again is only indicative, is actually slightly less and pushed slightly away from the northern boundary. Um, the council, therefore, don't we don't consider we have kind of any any additional evidence to suggest that we could defend a, a, a refusal on the basis of landscape, and that actually you know the inspector has 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 made that decision, and we we need to, to kind of follow that for consistency purposes. Um, I think one of his key things that he did discuss is that actually at Reserve Matters, a robust landscaping strategy can come forward and, and officers, you know, don't, don't have any reason to, to kind of disagree with that. Um, other matters, including ecology, have, have all been resolved now and the, the ecologists have provided some very detailed comments um, on, on biodiversity, net gain, etc. Um, so the key matter that the, the, the uh, appeal was dismissed on was, was just highways concerns, um, which obviously we feel have now been addressed. Um, Dan, I don't know if you want to add anything in that respect. Yeah, yeah the key issue at the appeal, and it's really very relevant to this case, um, is the impact at Thicket Mead Roundabout. And that, that's what the appeal was decided upon you know, less than two years ago. Um, the previous scheme did not promote any improvement at Thicket Mead at all. There was an argument about whether that roundabout could accommodate the additional traffic, and the inspector agreed that it couldn't. Hence, we're in a situation now where the applicant has come forward with a new traffic model, have, has promoted improvements to accommodate their traffic. So there's an interim scenario that could be secured, plus there's also the LDO in the background with a much bigger scheme and there would be a contribution towards that as well, if, if required. And that would overcome the issue that was decided at appeal. Okay. So, so, and, and, and just finally then, the issue of ecology and, and bats more significantly, has that been addressed? Because I know that the fields, the, there's a development that Curo wants to build on the Mendip side, which is a couple of fields away from here. Um, where the ecology report shows, I think, 10, more than 10 different species of bats, and several of them were protected species. So I assume that's covered in this as well, yeah? Yeah, so our, our ecologist has, has assessed the application at length, and obviously we know that the area is used by bats. There are a number of bat corridors. Um, one of the key conditions will be restrictions, restrictions on lighting, um, external and, and potentially internal if that's considered appropriate. Uh, so there are a number of uh, ecology conditions. There's been no objection from our, from our ecologist. Um, so I, I think it would be difficult to, to refuse the application on that basis. Um, but that's a matter for the committee to decide. Okay, if we're all done, can we move to the debate? Who would like to open the debate? Councillor Hounsell. Uh, after hearing um, uh, all, all your answers, uh, which have been uh, very thorough, um, I'd actually like to uh, concentrate the committee's mind by proposing a motion that we support your recommendation, uh, delegate to permit. Thank you, Councillor Hounsell. Do I have a seconder for that? No. Do I have a seconder? Sorry, Councillor Davis. Yeah, I'm quite happy to second, although we may want to consider whether any more conditions are put, perhaps, and the debate goes a little bit further, but at the moment I'm quite happy to second it. Okay, continuing with the debate, Councillor Hughes. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I'm surprised that we're, that 
putting forward motions before we've even had a debate. Um, that, is on, that is allowed. I, I know it's allowed. I just think it's a bit daft, really. We need to actually understand and debate what, what the issues are here before we move to any type of formal decision. But there we are. Uh, okay. So I think, first of all, it would have been useful if this had been presented with the bigger picture to show us how this interacts with the, the LDO and the, the site that's opposite. And it would certainly have been useful if we'd seen the, the highways proposals that are set out in the LDO and the impact they'll have on this development because they are significant and in some ways beneficial to this development. So it would have been useful to be able to see that bigger picture today. I think it would have been, been a lot clearer. Um, I do have some concerns still about Springfield Gardens. Um, they are almost going to be sandwiched between two new large developments. And I have got some concerns certainly about traffic movements and noise affecting these, these, um, these houses. Um, there's no doubt about it that there is demand. We know there's demand. That's why, there, that's why we're building the enterprise zone. Um, I think what's important is to understand that exactly what the demand is and how these sites complement each other to provide something that's necessary. Um, we are a growing area, Midsummer Norton area, in terms of industry, and particularly seeing that, um, that Bath doesn't have an industrial arm so much these days. I mean, most of your industrial areas in Bath are now either student accommodation or nursing homes or... Um, or apartments. So we are a growing industrial area, but it's important that we manage that correctly. So personally, I would have, I would have preferred to look more at the option of a, a site visit to get a, for the, for the panel to get a better idea. I know it's only fields, but to get a better un, un, understanding of the layouts, the relationship between where the industrial zone, the Summer Valley zone is going to be compared to this one and how that interacts with the residential properties around. Um, but I guess we'll, we'll see where we go on the uh, proposal. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor Hughes. Councillor Crossley. Um, thank you very much. That was a, a very full presentation uh, and thank you very much for the officers for it. Um, I think uh, this is uh, a scheme that has been well thought out, well considered, it's been adapted to previous um, objections and complaints. Uh, it's with an industrial area, with the old mills industrial site, so it's keeping it together. Uh, and uh, I think that what we've got here is something that's uh, worthy of permission and therefore I shall be supporting the motion to permit. In answer to Councillor Hughes's question, about why we have a motion at the beginning. It doesn't actually matter when we get the motion, but it helps frame the debate, uh, I think. So I, don't, I actually prefer the motion early on so that we can frame the debate for or against it uh, rather than having a series of point, people making a point and then uh, a, a, a motion. So I shall be supporting the motion to permit this. I think uh, the officers are to be commended on working with the applicants to resolve some of the issues from previous applications, well, I think this is uh, uh, good for employment and it's good for Baines and it's good for the local area. Thank you, Councillor Crossley. Councillor McPhee. So, um, I think uh, my concern is the intensity of traffic. Um, uh, Councillor uh, Hounsell has picked up on the concrete one and you will know that that has uh, been a real problem for us uh, suddenly from one truck a week we're going to a hundred truck movements a day and the other thing which uh, happens is that you get a large number of HGV trucks parking uh, and jamming everything up while they're waiting to, to unload. So wh what I was uh, hoping, or uh, um, sorry, the other thing that we could get is distribution 
um, companies which send off a hundred trucks in the morning and then they come back at lunchtime and go off again. So you, you can end up with a large amount of traffic. And I just wanted to be sure that uh, uh, somehow you condition it <laughs> that, that uh, what you start doesn't uh, exceed the upper limit, which I'm sure highways have an upper limit of traffic movements, and I'd like to feel certain that there's some control there. Uh, the other one, which was mentioned by Councillor Crossley, um, but he didn't mention it uh, just now, was hours of use. So in the one, uh, the area that we have in Canesham, there is supposedly limitations on hours of use, but very few uh, trucks uh, take much notice of it, and one of them in particular starts at 4 o'clock in the morning uh, and causes a great deal of disruption. So I wasn't clear whether there were going to be restrictions on the hours of use um, of, of that site. Um, those are my two points. Um, but given that I think, I believe highways should be able to provide the, the right data and that we can condition hours of use if that is what is visualized, um, I would be prepared to support the officer's recommendation. Okay, thank you, Councillor McFlee. Well, I think what I've heard that both of those two issues will be covered at, at reserved matters stage if this one goes through today. And uh, that's right, isn't it, Isabel? Yeah, I mean, in terms of kind of larger HGV movements, I think I would reiterate that these are small-scale industrial units, so the size of the units themselves will influence what what uses are undertaken at the site. Um, I don't think we could reasonably condition kind of numbers on movements, etc. I think that would be very difficult. You know, we don't know who's going to occupy these units, um, and I don't think it'd be reasonable and all meet the six tests in the MPPF. Um, in terms of hours of use, again, I haven't uh, suggested this condition at this stage because we haven't got a layout plan, and, and I felt it wasn't it wasn't justified at this stage because we couldn't we can't fully assess um, whether that's necessary in terms of impact to residential amenity. However, that is a matter of planning judgment, and if the committee wanted to add that as a condition um, and suggest hours of operation or hours of use at this stage. I think, I think that could be something that, that could be considered. Um, my view is that it is also something that could be added at, at reserve matter stage should it be deemed necessary at that point. Thank you, Isabel. So I'll go back to Councillor Hansel. I, I mean, it's your motion. Are, are you happy to leave those things for reserve well, matters? The, the, the only difficulty with hours of use, it, it depends what the uses are. I mean, uh, uh, as you've uh, said, uh, you know, under Class E, you can have a crash, a day nursery. When, you might want totally different hours um, to, um, you know, an industrial process. So uh, I, I, I think I agree with what you seem to be suggesting, that we, we leave that until we get to um, the, the specifics uh, later on uh, with um, another application. Yeah, I would just come back on that and say that the update report obviously has uh, recommended a, a condition um, which removes permitted development rights. So it, it means that the uses on site can only be within class EG3, which is industrial processes. So we wouldn't have the whole broad range. We wouldn't have offices or crushes, etc. Um, so we are, that does kind of limit, limit that down in, in that respect. Still happy, Councillor Hansel, your motion? Yes, I mean, I don't want to miss the, miss the opportunity of hours if, if, if that is actually really important at this stage. But if, if there's some assurance that that can be looked at ag again when we get to reserve matters, uh, I I'll leave my motion as it is. Yeah, it's my view that that can be looked at reserve matters. I don't know, Chris, if you feel differently. Thank you, Chair. Um, no, I think, I think that given the level of detail that we have available at the moment uh, regarding the, the, the final individual uses, it would be better to uh, leave that matter uh, to as late in the process as possible, really, so the reserve matter stage. Okay, Councillor Hanson. Okay, so I've got a couple more on my list. Councillor Jackson. Thank you very much, Chair. I think the way the debate's moving indicates the, the depth of the problem we've got, really, um, because you can look at this in 
two ways. This is an outline application. We're thinking about the general principle of development here on a greenfield site and this very difficult question of traffic movements, access, the best way to control 80 to 100 movements a day and so on. And of course what nobody's mentioned yet, this is very close to Tesco's. And we did actually uh, turn down their application for an extension because of this part of the road, well, one reason was the, the access, this part of the road being so narrow. So you've got sort of general principles on the one hand, and on the other hand, this question of hours and mitigation of the uh, harm to the residential amenity of the people in the terrace and, and the neighboring estates um, will come under reserve matters. And I think this is very unfortunate because some of us might think that this is okay in principle, and we're not going to argue with the planning inspector or anything like that. Um, uh, but on the other hand, we might think that the uh, landscaping, um, the design and, and the noise is, is intolerable and, and doesn't mitigate against um, the benefits of providing employment. I'm thinking about the industrial estates in Westfield. First of all, Westfield Parish Council are a bit concerned because some of our units are rather ancient and we, uh, we anticipate that the very successful businesses there will gravitate to a modern estate. Now that, of course, might be beneficial in carbon neutral terms if they're leaving a Victorian estate and moving to something very, what we assume will be modern and well sealed and so on but of course we're thinking about the employment situation in Westfield and, and this is where the question of the residence amenity is so important because I get numerous complaints about the noise from these estates which are embedded now in residential developments. They weren't originally in Victorian times when we had two mines going full blast um, and so but it's going to have to be conditioned, is it not, at reserve matters stage, the hours of usage and noise, because I've got two highly specialized car repair businesses doing very well with their sports cars and so on, but the noise for the neighboring terrace is terrible. So I would like to know if we can possibly condition in mitigation maybe an acoustic screen, maybe denser landscaping, but some way that, that makes it very clear that there must not be more than a certain level of noise. And I don't know, is it possible to have a measurement that could be put on it, that no business who generates noise above a certain level uh, will be permitted? But basically, I, I have deep problems with developing a greenfield site where it will impact on a scheduled monument and on a badger's set and, new, and the bats, of course, um, when there are brownfield sites available in the area. So, just to remind everyone, this is an <coughs> allocated site, so, um, but I, I think probably we've already discussed that matters such as noise um, will be dealt with at reserve matters stage, so um, if, if um, Council Hounsell is still happy um, with his... Council Hounsell? <coughs> Sorry, I'm just talking about the noise levels and such like. Um, I, I still feel that that should be handled at reserve matter stage, but I just wanted to ask if you are, is it your motion? Okay, thank you. Uh, so I have Councillor Hughes and then Councillor Day. Sorry, did you want to come back on that? It relates to another planning application. Um, I got a, a very long, very detailed email from a senior officer, excellent, setting out the rules as they apply today and stating very clearly that we should be applying what is currently available, I mean, what is currently the situation with regard to our planning policies, not what it was in 2014, and I am not convinced that we're taking into account climate emergency sufficiently. The question of traffic is, you know, has a bearing on that because of the carbon emissions. So my question is, should, should we not now be considering the policies that came into effect in January 2023 in this council 
concerning uh, climate change? Uh, I'm, I believe we are. Isabel, can you? Yeah, I can jump in there. So this application has been assessed against the LPPU policies, um, the placemaking plan policies, which haven't been superseded, and the same as the core, with the core strategy policies. Um, in terms of sustainable construction, um, that is, again, something which we would require the information at reserve matter stage. Uh, they will be required to fill in a sustainable construction checklist um, and, and other, other information. They're unable to provide that at this time because the design isn't set, so it's impossible to do all the relevant calculations. Um, but that is something which will need to be submitted at reserve matter stage. In regard to the traffic impact and the, and the climate emergency, again, this is something which it is a material consideration, but the application has been assessed against the most up-to-date policies and we as officers consider it acceptable but that is a matter of planning judgment. Okay, Councillor Hughes. Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, just to just be clear, I mean, we, we know we have a need, as I said earlier, we have a need for more industrial uh, buildings, office industrial, everything in Midsummer and Autumn. And as I said before, I own a, a unit on the adjacent site, which is currently owned by Farron Hayes. And I have to say that estate is very well managed. It's very quiet. It's very, it's very well run. It's in fact, it's the best, well, best run industrial um, estates in the area. And I've no doubt that this one will be managed to a similar high level. But we still need to have some, some constraints in there to, for, for the residents that live there, particularly places like Springfield buildings, we need to make sure that they, they're, they're reassured that there is some protection and some reassurance that things like noise levels and traffic levels are going to be managed. And I, I, to support this, I need to know that that is in there so, so, so when it's taken forward to the next stage, that those areas are going to be covered. So if, if if we can find some mitigation in there to do with noise levels um, and vehicle movements, then I'll be happy to support it. But without those, I won't. So I think we've probably discussed this now and that, that, that the noise, noise levels, for instance, will be covered at river, res, reserved matters stage. Um, so, I mean, I, I believe that we are co covering the correct things for this particular outline application at the moment, I don't know whether um, Senior Planning Officer to my left can confirm that. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think that if, if it's a particular concern of the committee, um, matters such as hours of use and noise, um, obviously the recommendation is, is delegate to permit. We, we, as part of that, um, well, as part of the committee resolution, um, it could be resolved that the case officers look at whether some conditions can be imposed uh, that do restrict noise um, and the hours of use. I mean, obviously, we, we would need to look very carefully at uh, what would be appropriate uh, or not, but it certainly could be included in, in the outline permission if, if, the, if the committee were so minded. Okay, well, we've got, uh, got three more speakers here, so should we just go through those and then we'll double-check that we're happy with what we've got. Old Councillor Hansel is happy with what he's got as his motion here. Councillor Davis. Yeah, um, I do know the area well. Um, I just heard Councillor Hughes say just now, you don't live there. I do know the area well. I've lived in Miss Manorton myself. And I, I understand the problems at the bottom of the thicket mead at the roundabout there. Um, you go down to the tip, you can find them sometimes. But I think the, the mitigation um, or the sort of things that are agreed here will help this. Um, I think this is an allocated site we need to remember. It has been to appeal, and the reasons it was turned, it was um, dismissed at appeal, if you like, was, was the highways. The work here is very different to what went in then, and I think that we would um, find it quite difficult now to um, refuse this, and therefore I, I do strongly, um, you know, I've supported the, the proposal to, rec to, to permit it. Um, if we want to add a condition, I'm quite confident that it will be done at reserve matters, but I'm not against it not going in at this stage if that would make the difference. However, I do feel that reserve matters, the officers heard what we're saying, um, if we delegate to permit, we, we've got the, um, the bit about the, in the update report to be included and so on, I think it's quite clear what our view is here, um, so I'm quite happy to go with as the proposal as it is, although I'm not against adding it, but I just think it might be an unnecessary thing at this stage. 
Thank you, Councillor Davis. Councillor Hodge. Thank you. Um, I, I've still got, I take all those points. I, I've still got, um, I would favour actually a site visit because I, I was, would like to be clear that the highways improvements and get a sense of, um, I think it, oh, Councillor um, Hughes has said about linking in both developments and having that further information and I'm, I would have liked to see the, the roundabout. I presume there's no improvements put forward before and whether the improvements are suggested, although they are highways say they're acceptable, it, it would be good to have seen them on, have an idea of it on the ground in that location. Um, so I, I, I don't feel confident not knowing the area to um, be completely happy about the highways changes that are going to be made in Portland and Parish Council also um, doesn't seem very accepting of them either. So um, I'm not convinced. That, I'm not sure at the moment about that. I would also like to say on principle that going forward for the planning committee, I would prefer a, a way of working where we don't declare a motion straight away. So I think it, it, it stifles the debate, puts you on the back foot if you have a different opinion. And I would prefer a system where we went round and had a discussion first, actually. Um, Okay, point, point taken. Thank you, Councillor Hodge. Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Um, well, since this is an allocated site, um, it, it's, I, I would find it, and um, it's um, it delegated to permit, there are still issues that obviously I am worried about. For example, the local residents will be very impacted by this. Um, so, so possibly, you know, as we've discussed, maybe traffic movements, um, some sort of mitigation on noise could be factored in at reserve matter stage. Um, but yes, I'm still concerned about the fact that there's only probably one bus an hour and, you know, and, and, and is it going to be very attractive or feasible to cycle and walk in that area? It doesn't look very likely because it looks like the traffic movements are very... Uh, it's, it's a very busy area, but, but on, on the other hand, those elements are outside our con control, so I would probably um, support the motion. Thank you, Councillor Bromley. So do we have anybody else to uh, take this to the vote? Councillor Hansel, can I just double, triple check that you're happy with the motion as stands? Yes, I'll, I'll leave the motion as it is, just because I, I worry that if we add conditions now, mm. um, we, there might be unforeseen consequences to it because we don't have anything specific in front of us. So I think I, I uh, think it's safer if we if we await the reserve matters before applying conditions. Okay, thank you. Yes, sorry, Chris, you wanted to say something. Thank you, Chair. I, I just thought I'd make a, a, a general point about conditions, um, notwithstanding what I previously said. I think, and it, it is difficult to put conditions on at the outline stage um, when, when there's very little details about what the, the, the final proposal will be. But having said that, the, the general principle is that uh, reserve matters, well, you can only condition things at the reserve matters stage if they relate specifically to the matters that have been reserved. As a, the general principle is that any, any condition that limits the scope of the permission ought to be put on at the outline stage. Now, I think in this particular case, it, it is tricky because, uh, as I've said, we, we don't know what the final details will be. But I, I do, notwithstanding what I previously said, I, I do think the safest option would be to put those conditions on at the outline stage and not leave it to the reserve matters. Um, there would be a scope of the scope, of course, to amend those conditions later on uh, through a variation. But I think that would be the safest option for the committee. Okay, uh, listening to that advice, Councillor Hounsell. Oh, right, well that's quite a significant um, uh, statement, so um, uh, I'm quite happy to adapt my motion uh, to include uh, conditions if people like to, would like to put forward now what those conditions uh, should be. Okay, so uh, Councillor Davis is happy with that as well. So I think we had uh, uh, one on noise, uh, hours, noise and hours of um, um, use. Was there anything else? To anybody? 
Sorry, Councillor are you Hughes. Are you talking about hours of noise or, or noise levels? Because they're both noise, noise levels and hours of use, comings and goings in the site. Yeah, so it's delegated to permit, so we can leave uh, Isabel to um, speak to the developer about that. So are those two enough, Councillor Jackson? No, I wasn't going to vote for this motion unless because of the lack of conditions, so I'm very glad we're considering them now. Um, I would like, I'm not exactly sure how you would word it, but something stronger on the ecological mitigation. Uh, for example, there are measures you can take to encourage bats, and certainly light levels need to be well within what is considered not likely to disturb commuting bats. Okay. That, that's uh, the first I, thing. And the other thing is I, I still think there should be an archaeological watching brief. So I think, think we have so the... So close to the Fossway. I think we have the ecology measures for the bats in there already, don't we, Isabel? Yeah, so there's already some pretty strict ecology conditions. I'm not quite sure how they could be made any stricter for the uh, Wildlife Protection and Mitigation Scheme details to be submitted with the reserve matters application. Um, there's already a restriction, a condition which restricts any new external and internal lighting will need specifications, lux plans, etc., to be submitted. Um, so if there's anything else that Councillor Jackson would like added, I'm happy to look at that. But I, I don't think we could reasonably go any further in terms of the ecological mitigation conditions that have already been suggested. Okay. Well, I was just thinking, Chair, that for the developer, it, I mean, that, that's a, you know, a good definition, but they might find it more useful if it actually said X looks or, or whatever is appropriate. You're just checking whether that's in there, Isabel. Yeah, that is in there. It does actually yeah. say light spill above 0.5 lux, which yeah. is the required level. Okay. Um, so the only other thing extra that's been mentioned there is the archaeological watching brief. I don't know. Yeah, I don't see a problem with that one being added. No, is that okay? Councillor Hounsel, are you okay with that? Uh, yes, I mean... Uh, so all this is coming under delegate to permit, am yes. I right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, obviously, I'm no acoustics expert. I wouldn't want to uh, uh, put any no. detail on that, but I'm more than happy to leave it to the case officer. Okay. Okay, so, uh, Councillor Davis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, we've got motion on the table, which is proposed by Councillor Hanson and Councillor Davis, which is delegate to permit with the additional uh, um, conditions around noise, Hours of use and the archaeological watching brief. Is that all clear, Chris? So all those in favour? Is that everyone? Okay, that's uh, carried unanimously, so thank you, everybody. Um, we'll just take a short 10-minute break before we go on to second one. There's no change of officer, but we'll just come for a break.
Okay, everyone's back. If we could crack on to the next one, uh, which is Isabel again. Um, Councillor Hughes, I understand you're stepping down from the committee for this one. Yeah, can, if you can go out into the... If you could sit over here so you're off the committee and then you'll make a speech as a speaker. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, I'll invite the case officer to present her report. Thank you, Chair. Apologies, members. You get two, two of me today. Um, so, yeah, this application has been to committee previously. Um, it's the outline planning commission for an access road, footpath, cycle links, open space, landscaping uh, at Silver Street in Midsummer Norton. Uh, members might remember that this application came, uh, I believe it was August 2022, um, and this is the site which uh, borders what was Mandip is now Somerset Council. Um, and they have a have a concurrent application for uh, up to 270 dwellings, which has now been uh, granted planning permission. The committee report makes reference to a resolution to grant. Uh, I have checked the planning uh, file on Mendip, and their decision to approve has now been issued. So we'll start with the site location plans. This is the same presentation as I, I've given before, but just to remind members. Um, so this location plan shows in red all the uh, development which is which is in the Baines boundary. Um, so you've got the access road here for vehicles and, and pedestrians and cyclists off of Silver Street. Uh, a portion of, of the site is in Baines here and then a small pedestrian cycle link into uh, there are other housing developments here, which we'll see on the aerial image. These plans are, are, are a little bit dated. Um, this, this application plan, sorry, this site location plan shows the boundary for the entire site. So the rest of the site here is, is subject to the MENDIP application. Um, and that was the outline permission for 270 homes. So the site, site aerial imagery. So yes, as you can see, these, these dwellings have, have been built out since the plans were, were drafted. Um, so the access is coming off of Silver Street here, through here, and then into the into the site, which is this bit. Um, so this is just a close-up of the access onto Silver Street. Um, it's important to note that the access itself uh, onto Silver Street has already been permitted as part of previous applications within Baines uh, for, for housing um, just off of Silver Street. The changes to this application is, is really the route it takes through that housing to then link it to the uh, Mendip development. And then this is the uh, foot cycle link to uh, Beach and Place, which is a, again a, a housing estate within Baines um, to link to link the two sites. And then this is an indicative layout plan. So again, these are outline planning applications. So the layout is is not set, but just to kind of give members an idea of uh, what what may come forward within the site. So these are the dwelling houses proposed within Mendip, and you can just see here the red dotted line, uh, which shows. The Baines, the Baines uh, district, and then this is the access off of off of Silver Street. So, as permitted, the access curves round and serves the uh, residential development, which was approved under a 2020 permission uh, in Baines. So, there'll be a slight change to the road layout to just link it through into the into the Mendip development. So, some site photographs. So, this is the access off of Silver Street. As you can see, it's already already just been started there and again just showing the access will go through into this site so this this development this site will be developed uh, for residential development that's been permitted um, and then this is just looking the other way across to the school so the application um, has been reassessed uh, in light of the Mendip local plan uh, judicial review, which was successful. Uh, the site, uh, as detailed in the committee report, was allocated in Mendip at the time of the last permission. However, it's, it, it now isn't allocated, but Mendip have reassessed the housing. Um, and in light of the fact that they don't have a five-year housing land supply, um, they decided that on balance the application was acceptable and should be permitted and have now issued that decision. Uh, we in Baines have reassessed the, the application in light of that and against the local plan partial update policies and officers are still recommending the application for permission subject to all the financial contributions uh, which were uh, secured as part of the application in, in August. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Isabel. So we have two speakers on this one. If I could have Simon Steele-Perkins 
Up first, please. Thank you, uh, Chair and Councillors, for allowing me a few minutes to speak. My name is Simon Steele Perkins of Waterton Park Limited, the applicant. Um, uh, as you've just heard, you'll remember um, at your last meeting, uh, oh, sorry, at the meeting last summer, um, you resolved to go on planning permission for this scheme in line with your officer's report at the time. Obviously, we've been delayed for reasons that you've just heard about and are set out in your report. Uh, but in the meantime, as you've also just heard, Mendip Planning Board has resolved to grant planning permission for the site to the south um, at White Post. Uh, and again, as we've just heard, that planning consent has now been issued. Uh, Mendip officers and your officers have worked closely together to ensure a robust uh, and well-joined-up scheme. And so uh, I would like to thank your officers for that. Um, because of our long-term involvement in this site um, uh, and in the land to the south and to the east um, uh, at Beecham Place, um, which obviously has been developed, um, we've been able to design a scheme which focuses on permeability and connectivity, linking the developments with green spaces and their surroundings, something often not possible with new developments on the urban edge. This application before you, of course, is simply for a short section of road uh, and footpath, which will mean that new residents and children on the White Post site and beyond and on Beecham's Place will be able to uh, much more easily walk to school uh, and elsewhere in the town, reducing uh, the use of the car uh, and, of course, bringing the other benefits of walking and cycling. Um, this will uh, also, this proposal will also indirectly enable the um, bringing forward of the recently permitted care home, um, uh, which I know has been a long-standing aspiration of all of ours um, on Silver Street. That will come forward. We have a developer and operator ready uh, and waiting to go. And also, as I've said, the footpath connection between Beecham Place and, um, uh, and Silver Street. Uh, you're, you've heard about the financial contributions which have been secured for the local um, and wider areas around the town um, and that section 106 agreement has been agreed so I'd be happy to answer any questions if allowed if you have any otherwise I hope you'll be able to support this application thank you thank you and our second speaker is Councillor Hughes the adjacent ward member Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I, I've stood down from the committee for this one because I have been and remain, um, I, I object to this development of 270 houses on, a, on our border, on a greenfield site. Uh, I appreciate the pressures that all councils are under to meet a five-year housing supply. However, we should not burden our residents with, for decades to come with inappropriate developments. So it's vital there should be a rigorous process that residents can have faith in and not just bulldoze through to meet a government number. A recent judicial review came to the conclusion that the process used to allocate five sites, including this one, were flawed and instructed the sites to be removed from the Mendip local plan. Now, opinions may vary on whether this, this is an appropriate site, but what's important for the residents of both Baines and for Mendip is that they have complete faith that the allocation process is rigorous, fair, and in full consultation with the communities that are going to be most affected, and is part of a well-thought-out local plan. Clearly, this is not the case. In Midsummer Norton, our infrastructure and services are already overstretched. Our transport, syst transport system is in crisis. Our road network is full. We cannot get appointments with in doctor surgeries or dental practices. This development will draw heavily on the infrastructure and services in Midsummer Norton without making any contribution to the running costs and also adds pressure to a difficult jobs market that increasingly requires a high level of commuting. Also, if any of you have ever traveled along the adjacent roads 
to this development on the Mendip side, you will know that it's been neglected for decades and is dangerous for both pedestrians and vehicles. I'm sure areas such as Froome, Shepton Mallets will, will find some benefit from the 81 social and affordable homes that are going to be built. However, they, owe, they offer no benefits to our community or our housing needs in the Midsummer Norton area. They will simply burden an already overstretched resource. Recently, we have seen a cost of living crisis with food costs increasing by almost 20%. So it's clear that we need to move towards sustainably grown local food rather than a dependence on imported products. So we need to think very carefully before destroying agricultural land. And again, this should be assessed through a rigorous local plan review. I firmly believe that planning committees such as this are here to protect us from poor developer and poor officer decisions. And as we have seen from the judicial review, this falls within this category. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hughes. Um, questions for the case officer? Councillor Jackson? I had sort of thought I might be allowed to make a statement on behalf of Westfield Parish Council. I'm, I'm really not sure why they, their opposition has been missed out of the officer's report or whether it never even landed with Mendip is always a possibility. But if I could just say a word or two about where Westfield Parish Council stands um, that I think they would appreciate it because they often feel that they're not being heard and I wouldn't like them to say to me next week why wasn't our view taken into account uh, well the objection if I think that's what, what you're saying is noted but I mean they, they had the same opportunities to put themselves forward to speak today as everyone else so Well, well, unfortunately, there are events going on around the place that they haven't actually managed to send me the statement that I thought we had agreed I would give. Um, but their objections are much as um, Councillor Hughes has stated, that the infrastructure will not take this development. I have pointed out to them that what okay, we well, today I, that, that, is not counts. infrastructure, it's just Councillor Jackson, I, I think, I think they, they needed to have followed the process and got their statement in and, you know, it could have been read by Karina if they couldn't get here, but you know, they need to follow the same process as everybody else. Do we have any questions for the officer? This hasn't changed since it last came in, so Councillor McPhee. My question is probably at the officer is... Uh, as far as I can see it, we've got a judicial review, which I respect, and is a due process that is used in Bath, and that the results of that judicial review seem to be being completely ignored. And I just wondered what uh, you could say to me that would convince me that I'm not just being asked to approve a footpath into a field. I can ask that, Councillor McPhee. Um, so the judicial review was against the Mendip Local Plan Part 2, which was their site allocations for development. And the judicial review essentially found that they, there was a flaw in the way that the allocations in this part of the Mendip district had been, had been decided. And therefore, Mendip were ordered to remove uh, a number of allocations, including this one, from their local plan, which which they have done. So Mendip, the, the Mendip case officer and, and Mendip council have, have reassessed this application, their application for 270 homes in the field um, against against the new the new principle of development. And the starting point of that is that it, it, it is an, a site in the open countryside. Um, Mendip, unfortunately, don't have a five-year housing land supply. I, I can't remember the exact figure, but I think it's around two and a half years, um, although I'd, I would have to check that. So they, going by the MPPF and the presumption in favour of sustainable development, they would have had to demonstrate that there was significant and demonstrable harm um, to 
permitting permitting these homes in this location and they have essentially come to the view that uh, on balance um, the, the necessity for these homes was was outweighed outweighed the harms of the, of the development and they have permitted their application for 270 homes that decision has been issued um, so the dwelling the dwelling houses the outline permission exists for those dwelling houses um, the JR aside, I mean, Mendip are not are not ignoring that JR. They have a, they have you know basically said that we know this site isn't allocated, but on balance, we still consider that it, it should the development should be granted permission. In terms of what Baines have to consider, we solely have an application for an access from Silver Street into the development which has been permitted by Mendip. Um, there isn't any reason uh, from officers' perspective as to why we should not support that development. Um, you know, we're satisfied with, with the principle and that it complies with planning policy. Um, the, the only matter outstanding is that obviously since, since the MENDIT JR, the local plan partial update has been adopted. Um, and so I have assessed the application against the updated policies. Um, any 3A applies to biodiversity net gain. Um, and as part of that, the developer would have been required to submit a, a net gain metric um, for the site. However, they have been able to demonstrate the through condition and at the reserve matter stage that they should be able to provide a measurable net gain um, at the site and, and there is a condition to secure that. And so in this case, officers don't consider that a metric is, is necessary and the application has been advertised as a departure to that effect. So officers think that that is the only, the only matter which we are kind of departing from our development plan on. Obviously, members have already uh, come to a resolution to, to delegate to permit at the, at the previous committee. Um, yes, there has been an in-principle change in terms of MENDIP's allocation, um, but officers don't consider that that significantly changes the situation for Baines. And again, would remind members that we have no control over whether this housing is built here or not. MENDIP have permitted that application, um, and it, you know, it is likely to come forward. Answer your question, Councillor McPhee. It does. Thank you. Councillor Crossley. Uh, it hasn't for me. I'm sorry. I'm still confused. Um, if a judicial review has said that this shouldn't be allocated, whose voice in the long run has more power, MENDIP or the judicial review? I.e., you know, why are we even considering this till the judicial review process is not completed? Will the judicial review not go back to MENDIP and say, you can't ignore my advice? So the judicial review has been completed. The judicial review ordered that MENDIP had to remove this allocation from their local plan, which they have done as far as I'm aware. However, that doesn't preclude development proposals coming forward on sites that aren't allocated. We often get sites in Baines that aren't allocated that come forward for housing and various other schemes, and officers have to assess them in that respect. And as I say, MENDIP have come to the conclusion that even though it's not an allocated site, it is a site in the open countryside, the fact they don't have a five-year housing land supply and the other kind of benefits of the scheme outweigh the harm of it being in that location and they have granted permission. They're not ignoring the, the judicial review in terms of what it has asked them to do in terms of removing the allocation from the local plan. Sorry. Is that clear now? No. I if the judicial review has ordered them to remove it and MENDIP has said, sorry, I'm not taking a blind bit of notice of you, I'm going to grant this planning permission. My question was, in the final analysis, whose view will prevail? Is, will the judicial review go back and challenge MENDIP and get them to remove it? Or has MENDIP's decision now superseded the judicial review and the judicial review has said, well, I made my point, you ignored me, okay, I'll lie down and accept defeat? So the Judicial Review didn't tell MENDIP to get rid of the planning application on this site. I think that's the key issue. The Judicial Review told MENDIP to remove the allocation. So MENDIP have admitted they know and understand that this site isn't allocated in their local plan. And I don't have their officer's report before me, but I did watch uh, their committee. Um, the planning officer made very clear that MENDIP understood that this was now a site in the open countryside and they were assessing a development 
which was pr proposing housing in that location. That's acceptable. A developer can come forward with a, with a, with a scheme on, on any site in the open countryside if, if they wish, despite the, ju the judicial review. So the judicial review has been complied with in regards of Mendip saying this site isn't allocated anymore. Um, and as I say, Mendip have, a, have reassessed the application from, from the change in principal position where the starting point is that the development is unacceptable in this location in principle, but they have considered other material considerations and come to the conclusion that it's acceptable and granted permission. So the, the judicial review wouldn't come back to them in regards to this, to this allocation. That's not to say there may not be further judicial reviews in the future, that there, there may be, but in terms of the judicial review that's happened on the local plan, they have complied with that order as far as I'm aware. So that's quite clear to me. You okay with that now? Okay, well, it's quite clear to me, and um, Council Hansel. Uh, right, just to uh, try to add a bit of clarity, am I right uh, in thinking that the judicial review would have been about the process um, that was at fault? The judicial review is not trying to um, replace one decision by another or, or saying that the original decision was actually um, a, a bad decision. It's saying that the process by which it was arrived at was flawed. Yes, that's correct. So the JR was talking about the process of, this, of the way the sites, um, of the way sites were allocated in this part of the district uh, by Mendip Council and, and the inspector um, when the local plan was found sound. So essentially, um, you know, the JR found that the local plan wasn't sound and they had to remove these allocations for that reason. Thank you. Councillor Hodge. Can, is it possible to, I know it's about process, but is it, can you explain more about why the process, it, was there, is there any narrative about why the allocations aren't acceptable? And if we permit um, this, you know, now we have, we're in a different situation at the moment. If we permit this, then that becomes, a, for those that wish to object to the development that may come forward now on the Mendip site of those 270 houses, the fact that we permit this, it will be a material consideration for the other planning permission or not is that is that the case because you, um if there's a if there's people that want to object to the 270 house development and this is permits now then it's oh that's that's my question does that does that become a material consideration the other way around yeah so i think i understand understand the question so in terms of the the local plan um i don't have the the, the JR decision in front of me, but uh, the, the gist of it was the way that Mendip had had allocated the sites in their local plan. They, the methodology they had used wasn't wasn't acceptable, um, and the the inspector at, at the local plan um, hearings considered it was and it was found sound. It's been re-reviewed as part of the, the judicial review, and essentially you know, the decision's gone the other way on that. So I don't have the detail in front of me to kind of give, give any more than that. Um, in terms of the principle of, of, of the Mendip now granting their permission, um, I, in terms of Bain's process and making sure that, you know, obviously that the process has been done properly, uh, when the Mendip uh, JR was obviously found to be successful, I did reconsult, I sent out a reconsultation. So, so, um, uh, residents and, and members and parish councils have had the opportunity to comment again given the change in position. Um, they, I haven't reconsulted since Mendip have granted their permission. I think they issued their decision on the 29th of March from memory, which is obviously four days ago. Um, but they, there has been a resolution to grant permission for Mendip for a, a couple of weeks now. Um, it is a material planning consideration, but that doesn't, it doesn't change the officer's recommendation. Um, and officers indeed did, did need to wait until they had knew the Mendip committee resolution to be able to write the committee report because obviously we didn't, you know, want to be recommending permission for an access which was going to lead to nowhere. Um, so that is, that is something which, which officers have considered. I hope that answers the question. It does actually, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Jackson, you had another question? Uh, yes, it's quite a rather different one. Um, those of us who are uh, um, familiar with Silver Street, the B3355, will know not only is it full of potholes on one side of the border, um, but it has no pavement in certain parts. It's very narrow and constrained, and there are 
terrible traffic jams from the island in the middle of Midsummer Norton right the way up past this site. Uh, I've been to quite a number of meetings about how Silver Street could be improved. I wonder if the officer could explain the importance of this what we're being asked to permit in the context of the general improvements that are planned for Silver Street. So I've just put up on the screen uh, the financial contributions which are being sought and, and have been agreed with the developer um, in regards to this application. So members may remember that last year the application was deferred so that uh, officers could explore, I believe it was Councillor Crosley's motion, um, could uh, secure a pedestrian cycle crossing um, on Silver Street. So we have secured a financial contribution towards that. Um, there are other improvements which are obviously proposed as part of, apologies, you can just see it cut off here, the, the developments which have already been permitted um, to, the, to the north of the site off of Silver Street. So these are residential developments that have been permitted within Baines. Um, officers don't consider that we can, we can ask for any more financial contributions, that we have exhausted the list of things that we can, we can justify um, for our application, um, which is an access, but obviously, you know, there is the material consideration of the housing um, and that really we, we, we can really control only what, what is in within our boundary. Um, so at this stage, Officers don't feel that they can go back to the developer and ask for any further improvements given the scope of this application. Sorry, that follow up on that. I'm sorry, I didn't really quite mean that. Um, I had the impression from the different meetings I've been to that Baines actually had a plan to improve the whole stretch, that in fact there's going to be another crossing going in. That's, but I couldn't quite work out where exactly, whether it was down towards the former Lloyds Bank or the railway? That may well be the not. case. I don't have that information in front of me, so I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Okay. Um, Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Yes, thank you, Isabel. Very um, detailed um, um, presentation. Um, I just look at the financial contributions. I just wondered, um, looking at this first one here, the £10,000 towards improving local bus infrastructure. I mean, is that, um, is that bus, bus shelters or what, what is that really? So I believe this is, this is outlined in the highways section of this report. Um, so the £10,000 contribution includes a new pole and flag to the Norton Hill School stop on the westbound side, a new shelter, bus markers, raised curb to be moved where the bus stop is currently situated at Norton Hill School stop on, east, on the eastbound side and the in, installation of infrastructure for travel in both directions on Fossfield Road. So it's a contribution, um, so the council will be undertaking those works. And just to be clear, none of this has changed from the last time we gave permission. <laughs> so, so if we're all done with questions, can we move to the debate? Would anybody like to open? Councillor Jackson. Well, I've given this one a lot of thought, uh, and obviously the situation has changed as a result of the judicial review and also the decision <coughs> that Mendip made on the 15th of March, but which has only just caught up with us. Uh, I think overall, the benefits of having um, this application granted outweigh the, possibly the harms if it is not granted. And going back, I'm sorry to keep harping on about Westfield, but the fact is that if this is not granted, we will have all the traffic from the estate disgorging onto the A367 at Charlton Court, well, just above Charlton Court, um, the bend where St. Benedict's School is, and this, this will put an undue amount of weight, whereas if this application goes through, uh, the Bristol traffic and so on will be able to get out through Midsummer Norton. It will, it's not going to do Midsummer Norton much good down at the island where there's always a, a jam, but nevertheless, it will be much better than having everything going out onto the one side. And secondly, I very much like the improved connectivity for uh, cyclists and walkers and the fact that now the children will be able to get through to the Norton Hill School on foot um, m 
much easier. I'm sure that in some earlier recensions of this plan, that was not the case. There was not the connectivity that we would hope to see. Uh, and I think this application will also mean it will be much easier to integrate the residents of this estate into the wider Midsummer Norton Westfield um, area and they'll be very welcome on the Shakespeare Road play area uh, if we get that nice money that I think is promised in the 106. So I'm proposing that we accept the officer's recommendations. Thank you, Councillor Jackson. Do I have a seconder for that? Councillor Simmons? We can continue with the debate. Uh, Councillor Crossley? Thank you very much. Um, this, is, this is a difficult one, uh, and, and in an ideal world, um, uh, Mendit would have listened to uh, the judicial review and, and not permitted this. Um, but we are where we are, and I think we've got an application that uh, is vital for the people that are going to be living on this estate in the terms of getting out in and out of their uh, estate in, in a safe and acceptable manner. And so while we wish, while we may wish that it wasn't in front of us, it is in front of us, and we have to consider it on its uh, applicant grounds uh, as it is. And I think, you know, getting the, uh, I think the officers to be com commended on, again, I think I commended them last time, on the uh, Section 106 and uh, Silver and all that other stuff that they've got for us. And therefore, I, th I think on balance, uh, we have uh, no option but to, again, uh, approve this one, even uh, though we may prefer that it wasn't in front of us, uh, but we, it is in front of us, and I think we have to approve it. Thank you, Councillor Crossley. Do I have any more contributions to the debate before we go to a vote? Councillor McPhee. But I think the point that uh, Councillor Hughes has made is that after five years when we've spent all that money, the local people are going to be looking at crowded doctor's surgeries and they're not going to be getting any council tax in. And it very much reminds me of the situation at Minsmere where uh, exactly the same kind of... Uh, uh, sweeteners were often offered, and I know that in five years' time w we, will, we will regret that. And it doesn't surprise me that the Mendip uh, councillors have voted for it. It was their decision originally to try and place that building right next to uh, um, Midsummer Norton, cynically knowing that they were going to get access to schools and doctors without having to provide them. And I, I have to say, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with the fact that they've overwritten the judicial review. I understand that what I have faced now is putting a footpath onto some unallocated land. Um, and I don't feel comfortable with that and will vote against. Okay, thank you, Councillor McPhee. Anybody else got anything to say before I go to the vote? No? So the motion we have in front of us is to support the officer's recommendation proposed by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Simmons. All those in favour, please. That's seven. And against? Two. Two against, so that's it. There's no abstentions. Okay, so that is carried. Thank you. We will now break for lunch. We start at 2 o'clock, please.
Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome back to the afternoon session. We have two items on the agenda. The first is um, parcel 2065 Meadgate East Camerton. If I could ask the officer to do her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this application is for a new agricultural access off Red Hill in Camerton. The application site forms part of an agricultural unit known as associated with Sheep, Sheep House Farm and is located within the Green Belt. The proposed access is onto a classified highway. Um, there is um, a condition here that wasn't included in the report, um, but it is a drainage um, condition, a pre-commencement condition. So if the committee were um, minded to permit the application, then this, it would be including this condition. Um, so the wording is there, but I can come back to that at the end. Um, so the application is part retrospective as it seeks to formalise an access which was created in order to facilitate the construction of an agricultural building granted permission through the prior approval process in 2021. The access currently consists of a gap created by the removal of the boundary wall and this application includes the installation of a gate, fencing and surfacing of the access. So this is the um, site location plan where you can see the agricultural building in the sort of top corner of the red line boundary there um, and the access just by the blue line on the road. Um, so this is the proposed block plan showing more detail of the access and where it would be, so the distances back from the highway um, and sort of just a more detailed plan of the area. So concerns have been raised by local residents and Camerton Parish Council over the highway safety due to the proximity of the access to traffic calming measures on Red Hill and the proposed increase in traffic that this could cause in the local area. The need for an access in this location has also been questioned. Um, Camerton Parish Council have raised additional concerns over the impact of the new access on the landscape character and setting of the permitted agricultural building and green belt. So this is an elevation of the proposed gates, um, showing the um, width and just the general sort of look of them. Um, highways have not raised an objection to the development, however have recommended conditions regarding junction visibility displays, the entrance gates and drainage. So the drainage condition is the one that I showed at the beginning of the presentation. Um, all of the comments have been taken into account. However, based on the information submitted, including a planting scheme, officers consider that the proposal is acceptable, subject to conditions, and complies with the relevant planning policies. As such, it is recommended that the application be permitted. Um, so this is evidence provided um, by the applicant's agent of the visibility coming out of the access. So the picture on the left is a view north coming as you sort of come out of the access. And the picture on the right is a view south. So that shows um, the chicane, which is part of the traffic calming measure in the area. And um, that is part of the 20 mile an hour zone. So the um, road along that um, area. Um, so, and that also shows the proposed concrete mouth, which is shown on the um, photo on the right. So a hedgerow planting scheme, as I mentioned, has been included with um, this application so on the left you can see the hedgerow planting scheme that was previously approved under the um, the application for the agricultural building and then the um, scheme on the right is proposed with the current application so it is slightly different in terms of there being a gap to allow for the access um, just on the left as you can see um, and here are some photos of the site uh, so we've got on the left there is a picture um, sort of taken from across the road or they both are taken from across the road opposite the access um, one's looking south down the road and the other one is looking towards the access so on the right you can see there's the agricultural building and sort of in the far side of that picture you can see the access already um, this is a photo taken um, just facing north up the road um, showing the 20 mile an hour zone and the agricultural building on the right and here are some more pictures of the access as it currently is. So in the top right, you can see the boundary wall partly that's been removed. Um, and so that's looking north. And then the top left is again looking sort of south. So those, 
properties are across the road from the access. Um, and the bottom left photo is of the current access, which obviously isn't completed um, and it, w it hasn't been surfaced. Um, and then the bottom right is just of the whole thing. So from the other side of the road. Um, and again, there's, there's a view north and south as you stand on the edge of where, where the boundary wall was. Um, so I took those pictures from the boundary, where the boundary currently is or, or where it has been removed. Um, so on the edge of the highway. And yeah, as I say, the officer recommendation is to permit um, for the reasons stated in the committee report, um, in addition to the condition as well that's been included. Um, so yeah, any questions? Thank you. Um, we have questions after the speakers. Um, and we have three speakers, uh, the first of which is Councillor Margaret Hutton from Camerton PC. Come up to the front, please. Let's start when you're ready. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Maggie Hutton, Acting Chair of Camerton Parish Council. And this retrospective application for the approval of an unauthorised agricultural access and the installation of gate is not supported by the Parish Council. When the planning for the barn located on the parcel of land for which this access is required was approved in March 2021, it was on the grounds that the access would be from the existing farm drive and a hedge would be planted to screen the barn <coughs> excuse me, before it was used. The barn is in a very prominent position. The hedge was required to soften the visual impact the barn would have on the approach to the village of Camerton, the green belt and the public realm. The barn was erected and used, but the hedge was not planted, and there have been two winters when that could have been done. If the hedge had been planted as required by the previous planning application, this proposed access would require the removal of some hedge, thereby removing habitat and green infrastructure, which is against policies NE1 and NE3. The stone wall, which forms part of the character of Camerton, has been demolished at this location, and this entrance used to access the highway, which has been both detrimental to the highway and pedestrians. The Parish Council wishes to see the wall restored, as there is a very good established access to the farm approximately 100 metres away. And it was this access which formed part of the previous planning approval. The existing access has a good visual display, sorry, display and provides safe access to and from the farm and the barn. Local drivers are also well aware of this farm entrance. The location of the new proposed entry takes you into and from the new Red Hill build-outs, which have been put into place to increase pedestrian safety. Large farm vehicles exiting and entering the farm at this location decreases pedestrian safety especially as it's directly opposite a public right-of-way. This means it does not enhance facilities for pedestrians and therefore does not meet the requirements of policy ST1. So in summary, this proposed access is not required as a good access to the farm exists 100 metres away, has destroyed part of a boundary wall which harms the historic character of the area, is detrimental to the landscaping conditions of the previous application, endangers pedestrians, and raises highway safety concerns, not only relating to pedestrians, but to debris on the road, entry and exit to the highway, and potential blockages to the road, which isn't very wide. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hutton. If I could have Rob Jones, please, now to the front. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of this application. The application, which is par partially retrospective, seeks to regularise the use of the agricultural access off Camerton Road, incorporating the erection of an agricultural gate and reforming the access. The site allows for the storage of straw and fodder during the winter months, which is then used as and when required throughout the colder months in alignment with animal welfare requirements. 
In March 2021, permission was granted to erect a steel portal framed agricultural barn. This application was achieved under permitted development rights and did not include the provision of a roadside access for which this application proposes. A condition of the previous application was soft landscaping works in the form of a hedgerow planting. As part of this application and from correspondence with the case officer, a comprehensive hedgerow landscaping scheme was submitted. To align with the recommended planting window for hedges, this planting scheme has now been implemented, providing the site with a biodiversity net gain, with ecology providing no objection. The access leads directly on to Camerton Road, falling within the 20 mile per hour zone. Highways raise no objection to the proposal and the subsequent submission of visibility displays has shown adequate line of sight to both the northern and southern directions. Along Camerton Road, which leads into Red Hill, there are multiple residential and a commercial access, in addition to the main farm access for which this application relates. In relation to the access itself, the applicant has confirmed the gate will be set back six metres from the highway's edge. The surface will be laid to concrete to stop the encroachment of any material onto the highway, in addition to providing a place to pull off the highway when entering the site and opening the gate. The proposal will also formalise the appearance of the access, building, back, building the wall back up, constructing a post and rail fence between the wall and gate, thus blending in with other agricultural accesses and entrances within the vicinity. This highway's access is crucial to the future sustainable operations of the dairy enterprise, with the highway's access pr proving vital over this past winter, especially with the wet weather conditions experienced, as it is considered un unfeasible to drive modern agricultural machinery across saturated fields in order to collect fodder and straw. In relation to policy, it is considered the application aligned with both the MPPF and Bath and North East Somerset Core strategy in particular, but not restricted to policies NE2, NE3, RE2, CP8, and ST7. To conclude, the applicant has worked with the case officer to amend the application to ease concerns raised by, pa by Camerton Parish Council and local residents, with no objections raised by any other statutory consultees. It has considered the application aids with the delivery of animal welfare standards on site, whilst representing sustainable development at Sheep House Farm. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And finally, could I have Councillor Matt McCabe, uh, the local ward member? Hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, as you have seen, uh, the previous planning permission, and has been confessed, had no planning permission for a hole in the wall, uh, did not ask for it and simply happened uh, towards the end of construction, we believe. Um, and so we can test the notion that it was created to aid construction. Um, the original application had conditions. You've heard about those. Uh, and those conditions have been ignored. Uh, we now have a full planning application that seeks to regularize, regularize those breaches and reduce the biodiversity net gain. Uh, and I'm afraid uh, what we have from officers is, uh, from highways, there is no objection subject to conditions, and ecology, no objection subject to conditions. Uh, the feeling seems to be that uh, conditions uh, are the way forward, despite the fact that conditions have been ignored up to this point. Highways have accepted the photographic evidence taken by uh, the applicant uh, standing on the destroyed wall. And what I'd like you to do is just imagine four or five foot of bonnet, and that photograph should have been taken four or five feet back. And if it was, when you look up the hill, you will see that the hedge gets higher up the hill, and you have less visibility the further back you stand. And indeed, the officer's pictures that you saw there were also taken on the boundary and not with any sense... Um, that there will be a bonnet in front of the car, uh, which means that, you know, for my tractor, that's about five, four, five foot. Uh, so you'd have to get your bonnet out to be able to see up the hill. Um, I don't think that photographic evidence uh, is evidence that there, the visibility is good. I think it is evidence that vis visibility will be very poor. Uh, there's also um, a very worrying statement in the application that says that uh, the vegetation will be cut down to facilitate the views. So uh, 
what those photographs don't give you is any kind of idea of what the conditioned hedging would have looked like uh, as a native species hedging either side. Um, and, and we have the suggestion that it would be cut down anyway uh, to a metre, potentially, so that, uh, to facilitate the views. Um, so where are we with biodiversity net gain? We have the original vegetation that was cut down to build the barn, so there were some mature trees, uh, and the conditioned hedging around the site that was to uh, replace that biodiversity net gain, but also to shield the, um, the built form in the, in the landscape. So my contention would be that the previous application sets the baseline for the biodiversity. So the previous application, with all that, that big uh, ring of native species hedging all the way around the plot, should be the baseline for the biodiversity. And what this application does is it removes a big chunk of it to create the, this new access, uh, and we have this threat that it, will be, it won't be allowed to grow uh, as a fully formed hedge. It will be cut down. So, I mean, I, you, know, you would accept that it would be trimmed so it doesn't spread onto the site, but uh, we now know that it will be cut down so you can see over it if you're in a vehicle. Uh, and I would like to say something about the landscape character uh, in the Green Belt as referred to by the Parish Council, GB1, NE2, 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 A and D2. Development in the Green Belt should seek to uh, conserve or enhance the landscape character. And as you heard, this wall has been a feature of that field boundary for a long time. And this little section of it was not obscured by uh, vegetation, so it was very much a feature of that approach into the village. Um, and I would suggest that knocking a ruddy great hole in the wall uh, and taking a big chunk out of the promised, the hedging that is supposed to be there, does not uh, represent enhancement and, and conservation. It represents harm. So I would urge you to refuse. Uh, I would certainly, uh, if, 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 you're, if you want to drill in, I would certainly look at where the baseline for the biodiversity is uh, from, what, from the previous application, which is, which is what is supposed to be there, to, to what has been proposed. Because I believe that represents a loss, uh, and I, rep I believe this represents harm to the landscape. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor McKay. If you turn your mic off, where you go. Thank you. Okay, that's all the speakers. Do we have questions? Councillor Jackson. I wondered if the officer could indicate where the um, existing legitimate entrance is that's referenced on page um, 65, um, because I, I couldn't work out where they had been getting onto the site before this hole was knocked in the wall. Yep, thank you, Councillor Jackson. So the entrance, as far as I understand, um, is currently the entrance used by the um, farm itself, which, as you can see in the bottom of that, um, the bottom of the photo on the left there, where it says cattle grid, um, so that is the main entrance to the farm. Um, and as I understand, that's the entrance that had been used. So previously, vehicles would, that's the main track that goes down to the farm. And then... Yeah, somewhere to the south, so, so not directly into that field from there, but it, the, the main farm is sort of south-east um, of us, kind of over there. So I think, I don't know if there's a direct track, as far as I could tell, not to that, that um, building as such, but I would imagine, obviously, because they are able to drive tractors across um, their, their own land, um, I understand that's how it was accessed um, previously so but that from the highway that's the uh, main entrance to the farm as I understand it already um. sorry could you put your mic on please I your pardon um, while well, you should recognize that there is an alternative means of access to the barns it is in an isolated location away from the other agricultural buildings how isolated is isolated it's a bit difficult for me to show you from this these pictures um, so as you can see there, there aren't any other ag agricultural buildings in this image so they are all sort of so it's, diff it's quite hard for me to put into context from there Do you, yeah? yeah just 
using that plan, um, there's a visibility of 188 metres to the south of the proposed access, so it's about 200 metres south of the, um, the proposal. Okay, uh, Councillor Hodge. Thank you. Um, for the officer, I just wanted to check something from the design and access statement for the previous application, the application that permitted the um, barn that was um, that there was quite strong objection to from the council. It says the um, agent statement says for access, the site will be accessed in exactly the same way as it is now. See attached plans. There are no proposed changes to the access. The access is taken from the private driveway owned by the applicants across the field owned by the applicants and into the site via the existing gateway. So um, that was that was the access for agreement for the permitted. What, what um, case has the, have they made for wanting a different access now? Again, from a highways perspective, um, I would have believed that they would want the access closest to the building as possible, so they don't have to drive across two fields. I would suggest that's why it's being proposed as it is, but I'll let the planning officer add anything else to it that we've seen. Yeah. Oh. Um, can I just be clear about the 100 metres from the existing access to the road? Is it 100 metres or is it slightly more than that? If the, if the measurements on that plan in front of you are correct, it's about 200 metres. Councillor Hughes. Thank you. Unfortunately, Councillor Hodge has pretty much covered my question. It was just trying, just trying to understand where the speaker said that this access is critical to the success of the business. So I was just really trying to understand why it wasn't included in the original application and what circumstances have changed that it's now critical to the business but wasn't when they originally applied. Okay, from a highways perspective, I can't answer that question. That's for the applicant to answer. Yeah. Um, we're just, I'm just assessing the, the scheme on its merits as presented. Um, okay, thank sorry, you. Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you. I just, I just wondered you know, how, how often the farmer has to access this field, I mean, to feed cattle, whatever. I mean, is it once a day, twice a day? I mean, that, that does have a, that does factor on whether, you know, the, 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 the entrance is needed and why it's being created. Um, so I think from what highways have um, suggested when they did the consultation response is that um, we consider that because there is a main access to the farm, um, it is not the case that this is going to be used as the main entrance because, as um, we've just said, most of the, build, the farm's buildings are um, quite sub distance away. So this isn't, obviously this access has been created to mainly access that building in the picture there. Um, so we don't know the exact, they haven't, um, given us the exact number of movements to and from, um, but based on the fact that there's another main entrance to the rest of the farm, we would consider it's not going to be, you know, created as a, a main entrance um, and going to be used all the time. Um, Thank you. So, in fact, it, it may not be used all that much, really, or sort of, you know, not, not, not every day, anyway. I mean, I know it's difficult for you to say, but... Again, given my limited agricultural knowledge in terms of what the barn may be used for, it might be used quite intensely at some periods of the year, um, but then... It, when there's storage being kept, then it would not be used for some weeks or months, potentially. But it, that depends on the farm activity and how they're going to use it. Councillor McPhee. How, how do you respond to the point of Councillor McCabe that actually with four feet or five feet of tractor in front of you, the uh, uh, visibility is not actually what is claimed. So the, um, the condition as written would secure a visibility splay um, that would provide a splay in accordance with the guidance from Manual for Streets, the technical document. Um, larger vehicles do tend to maybe vary that. However, you're also sat in a tractor which is higher than a private car. So there's, 
there's trade-off in terms of what you can see. And, of course, cars approaching the, the access would also see a tractor there as well. It wouldn't be lost. So um, whilst there's, there are greater, there are other issues to consider when a larger vehicle is making a manoeuvre, it's not necessarily worse. Right. So, uh, uh, and also uh, the other accusation was that you were cutting down part of the hedge rather than trimming it, I think. Was that, is that fair? Again, there's no plan in, I've seen that shows the exact st extent of the visibility display. There's no plan that I've seen that compares the extent of the visibility display with the hedge. So I can't answer that directly. But there is a wall. There's a wall between the highway and the hedge. So that's what would be predominantly affected. Okay. Councillor Davis. I think actually partly what I was going to say is, and I noticed Councillor McCabe talked about the entrance, but I was thinking it is for agricultural use and that tractors being much higher, though I noticed Councillor McCabe sort of not so sure about that, but going by what my brother drives, it's certainly going to be a bit higher than a car. Um, so I was just clarifying it is for agricultural use and obviously when the bigger things come into the barns like that, as you say, they might be quite frequent and then they um, are less, but I was just, it is clearly for agricultural use, yes? That's my understanding, and that's how it's presented in the application. Councillor Burnley. Thank you, Sorry, another question. Um, so, the, so we hear the hedge has now been planted. Um, I mean, is that, is that satisfactory? Is, has that been sort of check, checked on? I mean, are you sort of happy that it's been planted properly and is, is what you expected? Um, so we haven't actually checked it yet because, um, as I understand um, from uh, correspondence with the agent, it would have been planted um, by the end of March. So I think by the end of last week, based on the window they had, um, obviously, to plant it from various regulations. Um, so we haven't checked it yet. But obviously, if an issue came up that the hedge hadn't been planted in accordance with the approved plans, were this to be approved, um, then that could be um, become an enforcement issue, which we would then investigate as and when it got brought up. So we haven't checked it yet, um, because as far as we understand, it's only been planted, potentially finished being planted in the last week. Um, so we haven't had the opportunity to look at it yet. But obviously, I say, if an issue came up and we had received a complaint that it hadn't been planted in accordance with um, the approved plan, if this is approved, then, yeah, we'll investigate that at the time. So we can only assume now that it has been planted in accordance with what has been submitted with this application. Um, but, yeah. That's, hopefully that's... You have another question, Councillor Hodge? Yes, yeah, so was the lack of planting as a condition of the previous application. Was that an enforcement issue or not? So it was a condition of the 2021 application to plant the hedge. It was planted like this week. Was it an enforcement issue? Did it arise as an enforcement issue with the last application? Um, so, no, it didn't. It didn't arise as um, an enforcement issue. The only reason we are aware that the hedge hadn't been planted is through um, comments received on this application. So, okay. um, the, this particular application has arisen from an enforcement case, but that was to do with the creation of the access onto the highway rather than the hedge okay. issue. So, yeah, we've only recently okay. been made aware of that in the last, well, in the course of this application, Thank the you. hedge Thank issue. Thank you. Okay, we're done with questions. Can we move to the debate? Who would like to open the debate? I can reassure Councillor Hughes I'm not going to put forward a motion at this moment. Um, that, to my mind, there's a, a, there's a principle here um, that no, no one should get a benefit from breaching a planning condition. Um, uh, th this, this knocking of the, of the hole through the wall and then... Um, trying to achieve compliance through another planning application, I, I just feel very, very uncomfortable with. Of course, you can achieve compliance by putting the wall back. And um, uh, the, the recent application that we've heard of, um, you know, was very clear what was required, um, the, 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 the hedging uh, to uh, help uh, uh, obscure the view of the barn, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so uh, the gain of being able to drive for the applicant to just drive through this gate as opposed to 
driving across a couple of fields. You've got to weigh that against uh, the detriments that have been described to us and the gate coming out so close to the um, the sort of the traffic calming measures and a, and a, a feature of obviously of the village um, approach having been lost uh, and I'm just not convinced that this is the the right way to to go um, clearly it's only just now that there's uh, uh, planting of the hedge so that's another condition that that's been delayed that uh, would have been um, something for the uh, for planning enforcement to to have considered there are 450 open cases of on planning enforcement uh, that the likelihood of this rising to the top and being seen as a priority uh, is um, uh, un unlikely um, uh, so I'm uh, happy to listen to what uh, other people say, but just to reiterate, I, I, as a matter of principle, don't followed um, proper processes. Thank you, Councillor Hounsell. Councillor Bromley. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, I mean, considering that um, th this access doesn't seem to be we don't know if it's going to be used sort of, I mean, I know, I know the highways officer said it could be used intensively over some days and then not over several other, maybe, maybe weeks at a time. We don't know. It seems a major um, in, sort of an intervention, really, uh, so near the traffic calming area. Um, and also considering that the hedge has just been conveniently planted now and we don't even know it's been, you know, planted sort of according to any, any plan. And part of this historic wall has been knocked down. Um, I, I don't think I can support this um, application. Thank you, Councillor Bromley. Councillor Hodge. Yeah, I agree with the comments um, made by the preceding councillors. And I think the, um, the, in the previous application, the reassurances about no need to change access and the conditions about delivering the hedge for screening and for biodiversity, um, I would have presumed were important in in the barn gaining permission in the first place, despite objections, and I would be uncomfortable with this retrospective permission, and particularly with the um, impact on the um, road safety um, improvements that have been made anyway. Okay, any more contributions to the debate? Councillor Jackson. I'd just like to support the comment that these walls are a feature of the countryside around here. Uh, I'm afraid I can't quote you the number of stone walls which have been lost over the last 10, 20 years, but it does seem to me most regrettable that a big chunk has been taken out of what I would imagine is actually a historic line of, of walling, even though these might not be the actual stones that were there when the Romans were marching up and down. Um, so I, I, I think the wall should be restored myself. I'm, I'm prepared to propose a motion um, in contra you know, the opposite from what the officer has proposed. But um, other people may have other views. Councillor Hodge? On that motion. Yeah. Okay, I don't think it was actually proposed. Okay. Um, well, I, I would propose that um, we uh, refuse this application on the grounds um, that it's an unacceptable loss of a historic stone wall, which is essential to the character of the countryside around here. Um, actually, I don't agree with the ecologists either. Stone walls are really quite important habitat. So there's a loss of habitat. Um, and, and I think it's correct but I would have to actually go and see this one. So somebody who knows the area might support this one. I mean, knows it better than I do. Um, it is awfully close to that uh, chicane, and I, I'm not convinced about the highway's safety. If you're trying to maneuver a tractor in and out of here, that chicane is there for a reason, and um, I don't think this entrance is in the safest of places, shall we put it that way. Uh, so, Councillor Hodge, you're happy to second this. Yes, I just wanted to ask a question about the um, reasons, and just to be sure that 
by adding in a highways reason when, although we've got concerns about the highways impact, when highways hasn't objected, does that make the uh, decision um, more likely to appeal, to have a third, appealable by having a third reason that might not be backed up on appeal? Um, I would, wouldn't imagine, I'll mm. defer to um, Chris on my left, I wouldn't imagine it would make it more appealable, but that aspect of it on appeal would probably not be successful. Thank you, Chair. Um, clearly, there's no objection from the, from the Highways Authority. So, I mean, all, all, all planning decisions have to be evidenced. So, to, to refuse the application on highways grounds, in order to be successful at, at appeal and avoid costs, we would need to be able to provide some kind of highways evidence that supported the, the reason for refusal. I'm not, from what I've been hearing, I'm not convinced that there is any. Um, at present, and, and I, I, I would also mention that in terms of the, the impact on the wall itself, um, the impact of a development on historic assets, on heritage assets, is, is a valid planning consideration, but again, there needs to be evidence to support that reason, and as, as, as far as I'm aware, that there's no evidence that, that, that this wall is of any kind of historical value. Um, it's clearly not listed or within a conservation area. It could be a non-designated her heritage asset, but again, I, from what I'm hearing this afternoon, I'm not hearing any evidence of that, Chair. Can I come back on those points? I, I would like to stick with the first condition about the impact on character and distinctiveness, because I think a continuous wall, I think there is an argument that, has a, that in, the, in this location does have a... Um, does contribute to character and distinctiveness. I wanted to ask a second question about a loss of green infrastructure when the infrastructure hasn't been delivered. Is, can we, is there any, is there a planning, you know, how do we make that planning reason? We obviously feel that the hedge wasn't, hasn't been delivered and it won't be delivered to the extent it was. Is that a lack of, um, how can I express that in a policy reason, or that, that maybe the biodiversity net gain isn't going to be realised to the full extent? Again, that's for, for advice, really. How do we make that point? I, I would say whether, whether some planting uh, will or won't be provided is, is a matter of speculation, really. So I, I think it, that's something that could only be afforded very limited weight. The, the committee have to decide um, this application based on the proposal before them. Um, the impact on the hedge and the impact on, on biodiversity, that is a planning consideration. Um, but, but speculation about um, compliance uh, with previous conditions and enforcement action and, and so on, that, that, that's something that can only be afforded very little weight, I would say. So I think um, my colleague wants to say something. Could we agree the planning reasons are the, the, the impact on character and diversity, and um, not diversity, on, on distinctiveness. And I, I just wondered about the screening elements, a second policy of not delivering the full screening of the barn that was intended by the landscaping um, as a second reason. So that would be a uh, residential immunity, would it, for the lack of screening? Chris? Thank you, Chair. Well, the, the lack of screening of the barn itself is, it would not be relevant to this application because we're, we're not dealing with an application for the barn. Uh, this is purely an application for the access, so, so that's all that we can be considered. Um, obviously, if, if there's some screening that should have been done that hasn't yet been done, that's something for our enforcement team, but it, it's not anything that can carry any weight in terms of the assessment of this proposed access. Stick for the time being with one policy unless any, somebody else has something so, to add. Yeah. So just to be clear, the one that we've got at the moment is uh, loss of character and distinctiveness. From the loss of the continuous stone wall around the site. Yeah. Okay, so we can continue the debate. Councillor Bromley. Sorry, Councillor McPhee. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just wondered if Councillor Jackson would be happy, if, if it's possible, to add that this, this new gate entrance uh, hasn't been demonstrated to be essential for the running of the farm i mean would that be possible to add i don't think that's a planning for policy no. reason is it so I'm sorry I, I just i just said you know, a bit but actually the chair sort of kind of overruled um that it hasn't been demonstrated that this new entrance is essential for the management of the farm i don't know if that could be added 
by counter to the motion. Okay, but I don't, again, Chris can correct me, but I don't think that's a planning reason for um, saying no. I agree, Chair. Um, the, the, whether the business, the farm business needs that access, whether it's a functional requirement, essential functional requirement for the, for the business, that's not a planning consideration. We're, we're considering, um, well, the committee are considering whether it complies with the policies uh, in the core strategy and placemaking plan, and there is no policy that, that states that it must be demonstrated to be required. Okay. Uh I'll come back to you, Councillor Jackson. Councillor McPhee, sorry, I, I missed you out. I just thought I'd speak up just for a minute about the benefits of the, the plan. Um, I like the fact that the gate is set back quite a way, so you're not going to see that gate as you look up and down uh, as you come. And I like the fact that uh, they're specifying that it should be a solid um, base so that you're not going to get water or, or things draining out. And I note that the distance of that entrance from the chicane is about the same as the distance from the main farm from the chicane. So it's about equally uh, the problem. And if, in fact, most of the material and the work is coming from the north, you're actually turning off before you have to go through the chicane and there could be a benefit to that. Um, and my experience uh, with paths is that you put the uh, building up and then you realize where you should have put the path. Uh, and the, the, I don't know, but it could be pretty muddy on that route round to, to the barn. There may be a very good reason uh, why we could do it. But I, I accept that they acted with, without getting planning I also accept that the extra hedging is going to be good for the, um, well, the net gain. So it's well done. I don't feel so strongly about the wall uh, as others. So I, I'm quite happy to support it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Jackson, did you want to? Sorry, I was just... To some extent, Councillor McPhee has sort of preempted the line of argument, which I think is very important, but I don't think is demonstrated, that you need to show that the material benefits um, for the farming business outweigh the harm that will be done to the historic legacy, even if it's not listed or noted or anything, um, the historic legacy and the environment. I would say also the aesthetics, but perhaps we're not allowed to count that one in. I, I am not convinced that there is sufficient benefit in this development to justify the harm which is being done. We are in the green belt, aren't we? Or are, am I got muddled? We are in the green belt. Yeah, I, th I think we are. So We are in the green belt, yes. If we are in the green belt, then it is per se a harmful development. We just have to work out whether it's worth the harm. Councillor Crossley. Um, I'd like to uh, support uh, the comments from Councillor McPhee. I think what we've got here is an agricultural business that is uh, looking to make sure it gets the best benefit from its facilities and usage. And, and running farms is not the easiest uh, of businesses in this country. Uh, you know, it's you're competing against uh, a lot of other countries that have uh, different practices. And this is not a listed wall, as we've been told. Um, so I don't see a problem with it. And uh, like Councillor McPhee, I think the, the, the uh, applicant has made an effort to set it back. And I will be uh, Vote, well, we haven't got a motion yet, but I will be uh, eventually supporting the officer recommendation to permit. Councillor Hansel? Yeah, 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 we have got a motion. Yeah, yeah. We do have a motion, do we? Yeah, yeah. Councillor right. Jackson, let's put a motion forward. Right, Councillor yeah. Hansel. Uh, okay. Turn your mic off, please, Councillor Crossley. Um, as we've been reminded, this is in, in Greenbelt, and uh, I think we're right in saying that um, uh, any development in Greenbelt is by definition harmful. Um, there has to be exceptional circumstances uh, to allow development in Greenbelt. And I think Councillor Jackson you know, has um, nailed it, really, because 
what hasn't been demonstrated are the exceptional circumstances. Um, so it's impossible for us to, to, uh, to weigh up um, uh, the, the, the benefits, the exceptional circumstances, uh, as against the harm. Convenience is not an exceptional circumstance. So just because it might be convenient to the farmer doesn't make it an exceptional circumstance. Um, so uh, I just don't seem to have the evidence to support uh, going against uh, Greenbelt policy. Councillor Davis. Thank you. I've listened. Um, I do know this spot quite well. I and. When I think about a tractor driving over a couple of fields to get to the barn and I think about the mud that can come back out on the roads in the chicane area, I do think this access will reduce the likelihood of that. It is not uncommon to see tractors coming out onto the road and yes, unfortunately mud does come out and I know they have to clear it, but if the weather is inclement, which is quite likely in this country I'm afraid, um, it is easy to bring out mud onto roads and I think actually taking the shortest route in, which is, this, which is what this is doing, is probably beneficial. The, the Tractors are not small that would be going in and out of a barn to, to facilitate a barn that size, um, taking stuff in and out. And I think um, I'm inclined to agree with Councillor McPhee and Councillor Crossley that I think that actually um, this application um, should be permitted. Thank you. Okay, well, we've had a few opinions there back and forth. Um, I think we should go to vote, but I just want to be absolutely clear that we know what we're voting on. Uh, in the legal officer, would you just like to make a point? Yes, please do. There we go. Um, just to note in the officer report that this um, proposal is said to fall under paragraph 149A of the MPPF, which is a part of Greenbelt policy which applies to agricultural and forestry buildings. Such buildings do not count as inappropriate development in the Greenbelt. So it's just a clarification. Catch the line, sir. Uh, just to say, I, I, obviously, everybody can tell I'm, I'm conflicted. Um, uh, I, I'm actually impressed by the arguments of Councillor uh, McPhee and Councillor Davis. I just thought I'd uh, make that known. No, that's good. That's why we're here to debate, so we can share thoughts and influence so we're back let's just do this motion now so um, I just want to be absolutely clear about what the motion is I think at the moment we've got um, loss of character and distinctiveness well it's um, a development in the green belt for which I'm afraid I still think there are no special circumstances or exceptional circumstances to justify the harm done to a non-listed historic asset. Um, okay, uh, the, the paragraph that you read out to look at a legal officer now, um, does that also apply? Because we're not talking about the building here, we're talking about uh, um, access so, route, um, not the building. So in terms of the officer reports, perhaps helpful to note that um, the officer's taken a view based on the definition section of the Town and Country Planning Act 1990, that this would count as a building for the purpose of paragraph 149, buildings for agriculture. The, the relevance of that is that the very special circumstances test is in paragraph 148, and that applies only when you're dealing with inappropriate development. Whereas under paragraph 149, buildings for agriculture and forestry do not count as inappropriate development. So it's just to say that although we're in a green belt area, the very special circumstances test is not in play. Councillor Jackson. agree with the officer. That's okay. 
Right, so it, we're back to the loss of character and distinctiveness for the, um, the, the loss of the wall. Council Hodge, you still okay with seconding that? Yes, I am. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It, it, looking at the planning officer, is that okay? Right. So can we take a vote on that, please? So this is proposed by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Hodge, to overturn the officer's recommendation for the reasons stated. All those in favour, please. That's four. Yeah. And those against? Six. So that motion has failed. Uh, I'm afraid. So, could we have another, Councillor Davis? I'm quite happy that we move the office, uh, the office recommendation as printed on the papers before us. Thank you. Do I have a seconder for that, Councillor McPhee? Yeah. Thank you, sorry. So the motion we have on the table now is to support the officer's recommendation proposed by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor McPhee. All those in favour? Six and against? Abstain. So that one is carried. Thank you. Right, are we happy to go on to the next one? Just give the officers a moment to change places. Okay, would you like to start your presentation when you're ready? Thank you, Chair. Um, this item concerns Haygrove Barn, which is a detached barn conversion property in High Littleton within the Green Belt. Um, the application is for a detached carport in front of the property. I've just got a couple of verbal updates. Um, so the first is just a small error in the description of the location. Um, so the committee report read that it was located in Farnborough, um, it's actually in Farnborough Parish, but is located in High Littleton, um, just outside the High Littleton housing development boundary. Um, and then the second update concerns the permitted development rights for the property. Um, so a planning condition has been found on the decision notice for the original barn conversion permission, um, which removes permitted development rights for outbuildings. Um, the condition reads in full, notwithstanding the provisions of the town and country planning General Permitted Development Order 1995. Uh, no buildings, structures, alterations, walls or fences of any kind shall be erected or made within the cartilage of the dwelling hereby permitted without the prior approval and writing of the plan local planning authority. Um, no applications have been made to remove or vary this condition, so it still applies to the site. And therefore, no outbuildings, such as the proposed carport, could be erected under permitted development. The conclusion of the recommendation um, remains that there are no very special circumstances to outweigh identified harm of inappropriate development within the green belt. However, instead of the limited weight attributed to the committed development fallback position in the committee report, officers would attribute no weight to this as there is no fallback position in light of this condition. Um, so on to the presentation. Uh, the application site is shown in red with High Littleton down to the south. Um, this is the main house um, with the two outbuildings out the front. Um, there's a closer view of the relevant area of the site and on the right um, shows the site layout and where the new carport is proposed to be situated. Um, so these slides show the proposed elevations. The carport will be 9.49 metres long, 
3.98 metres tall at the ridge and 5.46 metres wide, with space for three cars and a volume of approximately 157 metres cubed. It will be constructed of an oak frame with timber cladding and double Roman roof tiles. Um, the site has had previous extensions, um, which am amount to over a third of the original building volume. Um, so the following aerial photos um, show how it's been extended over time. Um, the original barn conversion was uh, permitted in 1997, where there was um, an extension um, with that. It's unknown how large that extension was, but I believe um, it was an enlargement of this um, area here. Um, and then in 1999, so the, in 1999, the main house was this linear main house building with this outbuilding here, which was there before the conversion. By 2005, a large extension to the main house had been built, which was permitted in 2001, which gives it this L shape, um, and a small outbuilding was there in the corner as well. And then by 2017, and as the site appears today, there is also a rear conservatory and a much larger outbuilding at the front. And these are the um, aerial photos side by side, just so you can see how that's changed um, the site. So officer recommendation is to refuse this application for the reasons stated within the committee report. Happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, well, we have one speaker for this one. Uh, if Priscilla Roberts could come forward. If you'd like to just press the microphone button when you're ready to start. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. We moved to Haygrove Barn just over a year ago and we're now retired and we plan to live here for the rest of our lives. Planning permission was granted in 1997 for the conversion of farm buildings into this house and garden and we are the third owners since then. A few years ago, our predecessors purchased six acres of grass field above the garden to keep horses. So the whole property is now very different and there's a lot more land to look after. There's a very large field above the one that, that you saw on the picture there. We don't have any horses and have planted a native woodland of 2,700 trees in the field. So we now have a tractor and associated agricultural machinery to keep the grass under control maintain the large hedges, and e eventually cope with the growing forest. The outbuildings you saw are a garage and a small stable block, which are not suitable or large enough for either, for either of those, but the shelter would accommodate them on a hard standing, making them more accessible and longer lasting. Also changed since 1997, 26 years ago, is our climate, bringing hotter summers, as we experienced last year, and more intense rain. A shelter would protect vehicles and machinery from these extremes, and we would be prepared for possible future electric vehicle charging. We thought a timber frame building with reclaimed tiles to match the existing, sited between two other outbuildings, would be more attractive in the green belt than vehicles, and would be an appropriate design for a farmyard setting. I understand permitted development rights have been removed and there's a condition preventing any further building within the curtilage. I realize this request for permission contravenes that requirement and make it impossible to site the shelter elsewhere, but ask that the change in size and character of the whole property since the condition was placed to be taken into account when making your decision. It will enable us to more practically and comfortably look after the land we are pleased to be responsible for. As you saw in the photograph I sent you, the house is surrounded by fields, hedges, its own outbuildings, and our neighbours in the farmhouse next door who don't see it as a problem. This plan only results in the loss of part of a large gravelled yard as it uses the existing driveway. No green space is lost at all. If we're not allowed to do this, it's difficult to see how we can ever make changes that prepare for the future. So I'm asking you to take into account three things when making your decision. The minimal visual effect the proposed design, materials and siting will have. The effects both present and future of climate change. 
and most importantly, the increased area and responsibilities of the property. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. You could just turn the mic off before you go. Sorry. You just turn the mic off. Oh, sorry. That's all right. Thank you very much. Okay. Questions? Councillor Davis? Yeah, um, just to clarify, it says no PD rights now on here. So if they wanted PD rights, they have to come back and ask for them to be reinstated. Is that correct? Uh, that's right, yeah. And they could make an application to vary or so, remove the conditions. So you can't do an application, you know, you can't, in other words, um, overturn there's no PD rights and do the application. And go, they, they need to do that section first, the PD rights, and then if they wish to make an application that way around, yeah? I believe that's the process, yeah. Councillor Jackson. In the photograph of the courtyard, there was a building on the bottom left-hand side, which it seemed to me in the, between 1999 and the, 2000, um, the 2017 shot had actually been replaced by something bigger. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so are you referring to this uh, building here? Um, this one here. That's right, that's the one. And yeah, um, so this I believe is the stable building now. Um, so it has been replaced by something larger. Question, Chair. Um, this is obviously quite an old farm going back before um, 1948. Do we do the, the maths on a, um, a third, not, no greater increase than a third of the volume? since 1948? Um, so I believe that is the definition of original building. Um, I did consult um, historic maps um, and it did appear that the, the, the linear kind of farmhouse and this outbuilding um, that was there in, in the 90s was there um, and it didn't appear that there was any other buildings on site. Um, yeah. Okay, Councillor Jackson. I'm getting a bit old, you know. Um, I thought that question of volume applied regardless of whether a building was listed or not, if it was in the green belt. Perhaps the officer can enlighten us. Yes, I think that's right. But I don't know who wants to answer that. Yeah, that's correct, Chair. Yep. Yeah. Does the carport count as a solid building or is the extension of the 1999 and this stable block more than, already more than a third in development? Um, it is already more than a third. Um, on, the, the, um, on the permission for the, um, the extension that made it an L shape, um, which was in 2001, there was an informative um, attached to the application which um, just raised that the, following that permission, the volume, um, cumulative volume would already be over a third over, um, which should be kept in mind in future, for future applications. Um, so yeah, with, um, oh, yeah. Um, with that um, extension, and the, the stable block, it would be already over a third. Okay, Councillor Davis, if it no, I have another question. Anybody else got any more questions? No? Sorry. You had a just question, Councillor Hodge? Yes, just one. With the informative that said that in 2001 that what has been built already exceeds a third, uh, does it just have to be special circumstances that would permit something beyond that, or would nothing be permitted? Um, yep, yeah, so um, the MPPF and um, the, the Baines um, supplementary planning document um, gives the guidance of a third um, and claims that, says that anything over that would be considered um, an inappropriate disproportionate addition. Um, so that could only be permitted if very special circumstances outweighed. Um, and we're outweighed already that. over a third. We're, yeah, thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions. Oh, Councillor Jackson. <laughs> I was going to propose a motion, if I may. I don't think we've got that far yet. Well, it will 
concentrate people's minds. <laughs> yeah, we're not onto the debate. Yeah, I'm going, I'm going to invite Councillor Davis to open the debate because it's uh, she's a ward councillor. But no more questions for anyone. No, okay. Councillor Davis, would you like to open the debate? Yeah, thank you. And I think, uh, if I'm honest, since the, um, the initial report came to us, the fact that the PD rights are, are not um, available now, I think it's probably changed my thought because there is a process by which you go, had the PD rights been there, I think that maybe this site might have been appropriate um, compared to what it could have been. However, I find this um, quite difficult now, and um, I look forward to hearing how you, you debate because I, I do appreciate... Um, as I say, when we first looked at the report, the bit about PD rights hadn't come to light. Um, and I do feel that perhaps makes a difference on how you're going to debate this issue. Okay. So, Councillor Jackson, did you want to speak now? Well, I was going to propose that we support the officer's motion, regretfully, because we've got every sympathy with the applicants and what they're trying to do, but that we support the officer on the grounds that um, the PD rights have been lifted, so unfortunately they don't have the right to do this. They're exceeding um, the norm of a third without, I'm afraid, I think an adequate uh, reason for so doing. Um, it's going to impact on the openness of the green belt as you look at the thing. And, and that's really what quite concerns me most, that if you look, read this whole building as a an exercise in urban design, the character is going to change completely because you're going to enclose the court, make an enclosed courtyard, whereas previously there was an open vista out across the countryside. And I don't think under the current planning legislation we are entitled to change the character of the building so radically by making it an enclosed courtyard, which, okay, a traditional farm would have had, but this is not actually that much of a traditional farm so I'm afraid I support the officer's recommendation and suggest we all do. So that's you've put a motion forward for that Councillor Jackson. Do you have a second there Councillor McPhee? Okay, let me check I've got a seconder first. Councillor Hodge, will you second that? Yes, I'm happy to second that. I, th I think the, um, the the rules in the green belt, I mean, you have to have consistent decision making in the green belt, and I don't feel there's special circumstances in this case. Okay. Councillor McFay, did you want to add to the debate? I'm reminded of uh, the decision we had a few uh, meetings ago with Mr. Gunter, if you remember, who built a garage which he said was for agricultural uh, implements, uh, and we turned him down. Uh, at the advice of the uh, officer. I myself faced a similar thing last year and uh, uh, I was able to um, uh, put a barn up which, uh, for instrument and uh, machines. And for me, I, I think that would be the more normal way that people would go if they've got agricultural machinery. I didn't have, as it turned out, have to have uh, planning conditions. So I will support the uh, proposition. Okay, do you have anyone else that would like to contribute to the debate before we go to the vote? No? So the motion we have on the table is to support the officer's recommendation proposed by Councillor Jackson, seconded by Councillor Hodge. All those in favour? Seven. Seven. Against? And abstain. There's one against and one abstain. Or is it two abstains? Two abstentions. <laughs> So that's uh, carried, so supporting the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Right, that's all the cases for today. Took longer than I expected. Uh, item nine, appeals report. Committee is asked to note the report. <coughs> Do you have any questions or comments on it? No? Uh, date of the next meeting will take oh, place on... Sorry. Oh, sorry, Councillor no, Hodge. Just, just really noting the appeal and um, that solar panels on Watery Lane and that might, um, I suppose we need to take that on board for future applications, the weight given to um, the um, 
renewable energy is a, a, a trump above everything else actually in the end yeah this is the application of the solar panels that yes was turned down taken to appeal yeah yeah noted, noted. um okay Council. can i just say is this is the last planning meeting of this uh committee is no there's another one oh no <laughs> you're joking there is, is there? I was yeah. just going to congratulate you, but okay, I'll do that next time. Well, thank you. Yeah, we, we, have, another, we have another one. It just happens to, because it's every four weeks, we haven't got two in April, so you will have this pleasure all over again before the election. Um, right, date of next meeting um, will be Wednesday, the 26th of April, and if there is a site visit, it will be the Monday before that. Thank you, everybody.